Subcommittee on uh, Government Management Information and Technology will come to order. It recessed yesterday till today at 10 o'clock. We're here today to discuss the status of efforts of the Department of Defense to correct long-standing financial management problems. Two weeks ago, this subcommittee held a hearing on the first ever audit of the executive branch of the United States government. We looked at their consolidated government-wide financial statements. We learned that one of the main impediments to reliable government-wide financial statements is the poor condition of the financial books maintained by the Department of Defense. This subcommittee takes seriously the need to resolve these financial management problems. We've held numerous hearings exploring a wide array of issues facing the government as a whole and the Department of Defense. Some of these issues affect the government as a whole, such as the year 2000 challenge, improving debt collection practices, managing high-risk areas. Some of the issues are specific to the Department of Defense, such as the management of surplus military equipment. In a hearing two years ago, we found that the Department of Defense reported, quote, problem disbursements, unquote, payments that could not be matched to contractual obligations. Those problem disbursements totaled a massive $25 billion. According to the and the General Accounting Office, which is the congressional arm on both program and uh, financial audit, problem disbursements remain. We want to know the status of the Department of Defense's problem disbursements. Specifically, what is the Department doing to prevent them from continuing to occur in the future? Has the Department resolved past amounts, estimated at $25 billion, as I noted? In our April 1st hearing on the government-wide audit, we also heard about the Department of Defense's inability to find all its equipment and inventories, its inability to estimate report costs for environmental and disposal liabilities, a factor that very few agencies are dealing with, which the General Accounting Office believes is understated by tens of billions of dollars. Defense has had an inability to determine the cost of, of post-retirement health benefits for its military employees, has an inability to report accurately the net cost of its operations, it has an inability to account for billions of dollars of basic transactions, and an inability to ensure that all disbursements are properly recorded and reconciled. We'll explore these issues in greater detail today. We need to know what the Department of Defense is doing to resolve these deficiencies. Regardless of their effect on the government, the executive branch's financial statements, these problems are severe and we cannot allow them to persist. We welcome the witnesses that are coming here today and we hope we'll get the total picture from these witnesses. I think we will. They're the people that have been down in the trenches and know what is working, what isn't working, and what decisions are being made to make sure that we improve and not simply fall backward. So I'm going to call panel one forward. That includes the Honorable Eleanor Hill, the Inspector General of the Department of Defense, she is accompanied by Robert J. Lieberman, the Assistant Inspector General for Audit, uh, Mr. Gene Dodaro, the Assistant Controller General of the Management Area in the U.S. General Accounting Office. He will be accompanied by Ms. Lisa G. Jacobson, Director of Defense Audits, Accounting and Information Management Division of GAO, and Mr. David Warren, Director of Defense Management, National Security International Affairs Division of GAO. So if that group will come forward, uh, Mr. Warren, you'll be here, Mr. Ms. Jacobson, Mr. Dodaro, and uh, Ms. Hill. Now, I think you know the routine here. Will all of you and the people that are advisors that will be speaking, please raise your right hand and say, in the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee, you swear it's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. 
clerk will note that all five witnesses affirm the oath. And we'll begin with the distinguished Inspector General of the uh, Department of Defense, Ms. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss with you today financial man management in the Department of Defense. Um, I have a full statement, written statement for the record, which I'd like to Those summarize. Those are automatically put in the record the minute we introduce you. Thank you. <laughs> in the past, most DOD business processes were decentralized, controlled in theory by elaborately detailed rules and regulations developed unilaterally by organizations operating within their own functional stovepipe with insufficient coordination with other stakeholders, and often labor-intensive despite the use of many thousands of automated systems. Each military department operated dozens of finance and accounting systems. Data element standardization was never effectively enforced. DOD accounting policies were enunciated in a handbook whose precepts were not mandatory and therefore were widely ignored. And the primary focus of financial reporting was on funds control, not on providing the full range of financial data needed by managers. With the end of the Cold War and the imposition of severe DOD budget constraints, the Department and the Congress recognized the need to reform the entire range of defense business practices. For nearly 10 years, the Department has been engaged in reinventing all of these processes simultaneously. While indeed much has been accomplished, much remains to be done in all aspects of the Department's operations. My office has issued 181 audit reports on finance and accounting matters since I last testified before this subcommittee in 1995, and only a handful of those reports have been good news. The military department audit agencies have also done a substantial part of the CFO audit work and produced numerous reports. Although tens of billions of dollars worth of auditor recommended adjustments are being made annually to financial statements and hundreds of other audit recommendations are being accepted, I cannot yet report to you that the department has successfully corrected the many shortcomings in its accounting and financial statements. The financial statement data for most DOD funds remains unreliable and essentially not in condition for audit. In accounting terms, the situation still can best be described as a general lack of effective internal management controls. Consequently, we and the service audit organizations were unable to give audit opinions on the financial statements for either the DOD-wide consolidated statements or all but one of the major fund statements for fiscal year 1997. The primary reason for these disclaimers of opinion is the fact that the accounting systems supporting DOD general funds cannot compile and report accurate and reliable information. Accounting systems supporting DOD general funds continue to lack integrated, double-entry, transaction-driven general ledgers to compile and report reliable and auditable information. The information is not auditable because the accounting systems cannot produce an audit trail of information from occurrence of a transaction through its recognition in accounting records and ultimately to the general fund financial statements. As in previous years, DOD made huge numbers of adjustments, many of which were unsupported. For example, the DFAS Indianapolis Center made $350 billion of unsupported adjustments to make the FY97 Army General Fund general ledger accounts match the corresponding status of appropriations data. Because of the accounting system's inadequacies, auditors have not been able to obtain sufficient evidence or apply other auditing procedures to satisfy themselves as to the fairness and the accuracy of the data reported on DOD general fund financial statements. This is, this is a significant, long-standing scope limitation that will likely continue to cause auditors to disclaim opinions on the DOD general fund financial statements. The department does not expect to see most of the necessary accounting systems fully in operation before 2003. 
Since 1995, there have been various other developments affecting the general funds. And my statement lists several of those. I just want to mention a few. The Defense Property Accounting System, Accountability System, called DPAS, which was proposed as the answer to unreliable reporting of real and personal property, is being fielded, but has fallen far short of expectations. The General Accounting Office and DOD auditors performed a coordinated review of the reporting of DOD mission assets during the FY97 CFO audit based on a sampling methodology designed to result in a pass-fail conclusion on the categories of the items sampled, the Army and Air Force passed, while the Navy failed in three of the 11 categories. The Army Corps of Engineers attempted to produce auditable Southwest Division financial statements because the Corps had completed development and implementation of its new accounting system, the Corps of Engineers Financial Management System, referred to as CFMS, within that division. This effort did prove successful, as the auditors gave an unqualified opinion on the FY97 Southwest Division financial statement. That same accounting system, CFMS, serves as the basis for what is known as the Defense Joint Accounting System. Recently, however, the plan for DOD-wide use of the Defense Joint Accounting System has undergone major revision, and it is now unclear how many DOD organizations will ever use the common system. Two years ago, we participated in a joint DOD effort to deal with the long-standing problems related to control of government-owned property in the possession of contractors. One of the reasons for disclaimers of opinion on various financial statements is the lack of any reliable data on the depreciated value of an estimated $90 billion of property in the hands of contractors. It was agreed that the appropriated, appropriate accounting treatment for this property would be identified and the necessary instructions would be provided to the owning activities or, uh, or DOD property administrators. Unfortunately, no progress has been made. Let me briefly also turn to some of the issues pertaining to the Defense Department working capital funds. In December 1996, the Under Secretary of Defense Comptroller announced that the Defense Business Operations Fund would be broken up and replaced with several working capital funds. Unfortunately, this restructuring did not eliminate the financial reporting deficiencies that caused disclaimers of audit opinions on Defense Business Operations Fund financial statements for FY92 through FY96. For example, adjustments made to the Air Force, Transportation Command and Joint Logistics System Center working capital funds by the DFAS Denver Center were not adequately supported. In FY96, the Denver Center made 124 adjustments for $227 billion, of which 111 adjustments for $217 billion were not supported. If DFAS had adequate accounting systems, many of these adjustments would be unnecessary. The department has developed a long-term plan to reduce the number of accounting systems from 82 to 15 that support the working capital funds and to correct the deficiencies in the systems selected for retention. Although some progress has been made in eliminating systems, few working capital fund accounting systems have implemented the U.S. Standard General Ledger, and no systems are fully compliant with federal financial management system requirements and federal accounting standards. Significant control weaknesses continue to affect the accurate reporting of inventory accounts in several working capital fund business areas. These weaknesses will affect the fair presentation of both the individual working capital fund and DOD-wide financial statements and prevent favorable audit opinions. We believe the most serious problems in accounting systems will remain unresolved for some time. Most of the operations financed by these working capital funds fall under the purview of the supply, maintenance, transportation, communications, and information processing communities within the department. And much of the data feeding the financial systems comes from non-financial systems. We believe that the commitment of DOD managers to the goal of the CFO Act, compliance, of compliance with the CFO Act, is 
especially outside the finance and accounting community, very tenuous. Signals such as the previously mentioned inability to get all major DOD organizations to use the supposedly joint defense property accountability system are disquieting. We believe that closer Office of the Secretary of Defense level oversight of these systems development efforts is crucial. We have been disappointed that the DOD Senior Financial Management Oversight Council, which was described as the capstone of the DOD financial management reform organizational structure, has not met in over a year and has not discussed compliance with the CFO Act in four years. Although CFO Act issues are frequently discussed among leaders of the DOD finance and accounting organizations, the leaders of many non-finance functional areas need to be more actively engaged. Another frustration that is widely evident in the Department of Defense concerns the excessive complexity of DOD accounting. It is ironic that there, that there is strong support for streamlining organizations, regulations, and processes, yet there is dogged resistance to the concept of simplifying our accounting. The department is moving forward in reducing the number of finance and accounting systems, which stood at 324 in 1991 and is down to 122 now. The goal is 23 by FY 2003. Whether we have hundreds of systems or just a few, however, there will still be tremendous complexity, workload, and vulnerability to errors unless we also re-engineer the accounting structure itself. The department's accounting methods were designed decades ago to maintain the integrity of each of the tens of thousands accounts maintained by the Department of Defense in what is undoubtedly the most complicated chart of accounts in the world. This multiplicity of colors of money is a root cause of the formidable DOD problems with the accuracy of accounting data, the complexity of our contracts, the difficulty of properly managing disbursements and progress payments, the high overhead costs of DOD budget and accounting operations, and the considerable restrictions on the flexibility of managers to shift funds quickly to meet contingencies. Millions of documents must contain at least one, and in some cases, many accounting classification codes that typically have from 46 to 55 characters each. Compare 16 characters used for a typical commercial credit card to the 46 characters in the example that we have cited in our statement, which is a site from a typical Navy fund site. And I might add, I'm told that that site which we give you in the statement, which is 46 characters, would actually be further enhanced by an additional contract number and a fund site. So it would come out to something like 61 characters. We believe that the DOD and the Congress ought to reconsider the need for so many discrete appropriations and sub-accounts. These kinds of issues are seldom considered in the context of management reform, but we believe that any streamlining of DOD financial management requirements would considerably assist managers in cutting overhead costs throughout the department. During my previous testimony, I recounted that as long as 213 years ago, the Congress and the military establishment had been debating the need for adequate audit trails for military expenditures. Unfortunately, we are now going on 217 years, and the department still cannot provide you an acceptable accounting of expenditures. In closing, I just want to assure the chairman that the DOD audit community is in fact very much aware of the explicit mandates of this, on this subject and we will continue to do all that we can to move the department forward to hopefully full compliance with the CFO Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank you. And now we have the distinguished assistant controller general, Mr. Dodero, who will finally take a day off this week, <laughs> tomorrow, not today. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Kucinich. Uh, we're pleased to be here today to discuss financial management at the Department of Defense. I think Ms. Hill has provided a very good enumeration of all the uh, problems impeding rendering an opinion on the Department of uh, Defense's financial statements. And my statement details our views on many of the sim same topics. So consequently, this morning, I'd like to focus on four major points. 
Uh, number one, I'd like to underscore the importance role that DOD plays in GAO shaping its opinion on the overall consolidated financial statements of the federal government. DOD's size and scope of operations has a tremendous impact on the consolidated reporting of the federal government's assets, liabilities, and cost of operations. The problems that Ms. Hill and we have reported uh, collectively uh, represent the largest single obstacle to ever obtaining an unqualified opinion on the consolidated statements of the United States government. And greater progress will have to be made if the executive branch is to achieve their goal of obtaining an unqualified opinion on the financial statements for fiscal year 1999. My second point is that many of these problems uh, are not just accounting problems. Uh, basically, it's obvious the impact that they have, though, on the inability to establish proper accountability for the department's expenditures but many of these problems that have been identified in the audits also impair the department's ability to operate in the most cost-effective uh, and efficient manner possible. For example, uh, lack of adequate access uh, or uh, adequate uh, visibility over their assets is a contributing factor in the billions of dollars in excess inventory that the department purchases. Uh, this drains resources away from defense priorities on readiness and developing and modernizing their weapon systems. Also, serious uh, weaknesses in computer security can compromise military operations and also uh, makes the information in the financial and logistical systems and the unclassified systems uh, particularly vulnerable to uh, unauthorized access, intrusion, manipulation, and, uh, and even destruction of some of the information. Also, the inability to accurately account for all liabilities has obvious repercussions on your ability to accurately estimate your downstream cost in making resource decisions. In addition, the inability to accurately develop cost accounting information and reliable performance measures will uh, basically undermine the ability of the department to successfully and fully implement the Government Performance and Results Act as well. So there's all sorts of other management reforms that rest upon having a good financial management foundation and the department doesn't have that and they're going to be continue to be hampered in their ability to bring about the full range of financial management reforms. My third point is that basically short-term progress in developing at least good year-end financial information has to be made. I was uh, here yesterday talking about the fact that the Internal Revenue Service has tremendous problems with its financial management systems, and they need to be modernized as well. But through uh, designing special procedures and tests, statistical sampling techniques, uh, we in the Internal Revenue Service have been able to get to a point where we can at least get good year-end information on their activities. Uh, the Department of Energy, for example, has not only estimated their full range of environmental liabilities, but they've been able to obtain an unqualified opinion on their financial statement. So progress is possible, but in the short term, we must find ways to uh, make similar progress at the Department of Defense. This is particularly true uh, because of the year 2000 problem. Long-term system development efforts at this point are going to have to take a back seat to fixing the existing financial management and other systems in the department in order to make them year 2000 compliant. So we're basically going to have to operate largely as a government, DOD, with the existing structure at least until we can assure year 2000 compliance. Now some of the systems will be replaced, but most are going to be repaired uh, during this interim period. So uh, it uh, underscores the fact uh, that we need to focus on short-term solutions to these problems while we're awaiting long-term modernization efforts. And progress is possible, but it's going to take a, a lot of commitment and dedication and hard work on the part of both the department uh, managers across the department as well as the uh, assistance from the audit uh, community. My last fourth and final point is basically to reiterate Ms. Hill's uh, views on the need for leadership. Uh, 
Nowhere across the federal government have we seen improvements that have been put in place in financial management without dedicated, sustained uh, leadership on the part of the top officials in the department. This is particularly important at the Department of Defense, since many of the solutions to these problems transcend the organizational and functional boundaries and call for leadership at the highest levels in the department. Uh, I think this is uh, possible uh, and, and really needs to be uh, focused on with appropriate plans and established accountability. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to uh, publicly thank Ms. Hill and her organization for cooperating with us and exercising our responsibilities to render an opinion on the government-wide consolidated financial statements, uh, as well as cooperation we've received from the department. Uh, and I'd like to reiterate our commitment uh, to continue to work with the Department of Defense in solving these problems and bringing about full accountability and improvements uh, that can enhance its ability to accomplish its mission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'd be pleased to answer any questions. Uh, well, we thank uh, both of you. Uh, let me start out with just a simple fact. When we held this hearing several years ago, I would swear on a 20 Bibles that I was told there were 49 different accounting systems in the Department of Defense. When I mentioned this the other day to the representatives of the General Accounting Office, I was told there were several hundred accounting systems. I read uh, Inspector General Hill's statement on page 11. She says the Department of Defense long-run plan is to reduce accounting systems and uh, cut uh, 82 down to 15. Mr. Toy, who will be our second uh, panel witness, on page eight, 8 says, work to eliminate 100 accounting systems by 2003, so there will be no more than 23. Does anybody have the magic number of how many accounting systems float around that big building and its vast empire across the world? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, yes. I think that the figure we cite on page 11 is the ones for the working capital funds. So it may be, it's a just subset. Just the working right, capital. Right. It's a, it's a subset of the accounting systems for yeah. all. Just that particular number is working capital fund accounting systems. Yeah. But you, yeah, you, you go, are absolutely right. It's very confusing. Can you give right, a decent guess as to how many different accounting systems the Department of Defense confronts? <sighs> 122, I think, right now. What? 122. Uh, get the microphone closer. We 122. 122. Okay. Which well, is down considerably, I think, from over 300. And yes. I think I think Mr. Toy's statement cites 100. And I could be wrong on this. I think it cites 156, but I think he's he may be including that accounting and finance systems. Yeah. Well, There's we'll, also we'll, some confusion as to some numbers are just yeah. accounting systems, some are accounting and No, finance. I just want to begin with one right. of the obstacles here is you have a variety of different right. accounting systems. 49 made me angry two years ago, <laughs> and they seem to have grown like rabbits if 122 is uh, right. accurate. So uh, obviously we face problems on uh, modernization, everything else, integration. I was uh, glad to see they are on the government federal uh, ledger now. That's a plus. But let me ask you. Mr. Chairman, let me, let me just, I think I yeah. can clear up the confusion on the 49. When, when that question was asked a couple years ago, they had the 249 systems at that point, and they've been further consolidating, as noted, and are at the 122 or 156 now, as, uh, depending on whether you count just accounting systems or finance systems. However, a point that we've made is there really is not a good complete inventory of the financial management systems in the department, and that's been an impediment in designing uh, an overall systems architecture that can really bring together the feeder information throughout the department as well as the core financial management systems. And also the point I'd make on the standard general ledger uh, issue is that that basically was initiated by the Department of Treasury over a decade ago and, and should have been in place. And I'm glad to see the departments moved in that direction now as well. And that was, though, reinforced by the fact that the Congress passed a statute in, in 1996, the Federal Financial Management Improvement Act, that made that a legal uh, requirement. Uh, can't the secretary just mandate that there be one system, or is anybody even working on that in defense? 
I'll ask Mr. Toy that, but I'd like to know what your observations are. There were uh, some efforts uh, to develop a, a, a single accounting system based upon a system that the Corps of Engineers had developed uh, for their own operations. Uh, but the uh, efforts to uh, promulgate that throughout the department have been stalled, and there really isn't, uh, uh, I don't think right now, a, a good plan to move toward uh, the integrated systems. Part of the problem, and we note this in our testimony, is that the building block for developing integrated systems is a concept of operation with data definitions, data standards, data flows. And that concept of operation is not in place, and it needs to embrace not only the accounting systems, but the feeder financial systems. Uh, the Congress has required, as of last year in the defense uh, appropriation bill, that the department develop a concept of operations and submit it to the Congress uh, this September. So we're hopeful that will be a good starting point for the development of a good plan to get some long-term systems uh, in place. I am a little concerned, though, about the imperative urgency of fixing uh, and, and uh, being compliant with the year 2000 problem. Uh, we have some concerns about the department's progress that they've made, and we'll be submitting a, a separate report uh, to you soon on that issue. I think speaking of plans and your submission, I was very impressed by what the General Accounting Office had to say, that the Department of Defense did not report billions of dollars in costs for environmental cleanup and the disposal of various defense assets, including cost of disposing of disposal of nuclear submarines estimated to range from $18 million to $61 million per submarine. That's one of them. That ought to wake up a few people around here. The cost of one Nimitz-class nuclear carrier is estimated to be at 807 million. This is now assuming disposal, I take it, and uh, all the nuclear reactors, et cetera, that are involved with that and how you uh, deal with that type of radiation. 807 million to 942 million for the first carrier, and then such a bargain, with the cost per ship coming down to 500 million per Nimitz carrier. The total projected cost to clean up and dispose the Nimitz class, all Nimitz carriers in the fleet, is roughly five to ten billion dollars. Now, we also have the cost to dispose of aircraft, including up to $105,000 per aircraft for demilitarization and up to $123,000 per aircraft for removal of hazardous materials. And, of course, everybody wants a new aircraft line every few years. The only thing that survived around here for 30 or 40 years, I think, is the C-130. The cost to dispose of aircraft includes up to 105,000, as I said, for demilitarization, 123,000 on the hazardous. Well, we move now from the Air Force and the Navy, and we look at the Army. Ammunition disposal for the Army is estimated at $1.3 billion to $2.1 billion. Then we look at training ranges, which everybody has, and the problem of all the stuff that's been shot across that range for maybe a century in some cases, or two centuries, to clean up the unexploded ordnance. That estimate is roughly $20 billion. The cost to clean up chemical weapons, such as the Dugway Proving Ground and other places. I noticed the other day they are trying to ship some of the hazardous materials out of that part of Utah. Reported it cost $10.6 billion, is understated, says the General Accounting Office, by $8.5 billion. What have you done to work with the Department of Defense to get these costs recorded and reported? I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Jacobson to elaborate on that issue, Mr. Chairman, but uh, this uh, issue, and to, uh, to Lisa's credit, we've been working very proactively with the Department to issue a series of reports outlining the factors that need to be considered in arriving at these appropriate liabilities. Uh, we've been working very closely uh, with Ms. Hill and Ms. Mr. Lieberman on their role in auditing the figures. And we've complemented that by really uh, issuing these in-depth reports that you're citing in there are the result of, uh, of our efforts. Lisa? Ms. Jacobson, you're the Director of Defense Audits. How long have you been doing that? Uh, about two years now. 
Um, I just add that we have been out in the field trying to identify the kinds of documentation that exists to estimate these liabilities. And we do, uh, we've issued four reports, uh, one on ships, ammo, missiles, and aircraft. And uh, in each of those, we found that there is information available that they can use to either, that they already have estimates on certain weapon systems, or that they can use those estimates and their, the methodology that they used in developing those to, uh, to develop estimates on ones that they don't currently have. So there is available information, and, and they should be, should be able to implement it. In the reports, we had indicated that they should make that effort for 1997, uh, and that should have been included in, in the liability. Um, the department indicated that they didn't have adequate time to develop a policy DOD-wide uh, to do that. The uh, environmental costs are usually the last thing anybody wants to project or deal with. Now, have you found the Department of Defense is willing to put real analysis into this and give us a real figure? I think a lot of these are probably uh, out of a cloud, but I'm used to that. And uh, my second question would be, is there any interest on the part of the authorization committees and the appropriation subcommittees in both bodies? Um. As uh, Jean stated, the authorization committees have, in the past, required um, certain estimates. The ammo, one of the one of the reasons that we know information is available is because the authorization bills had previously asked the department to estimate that. Um, the estimate now is a little bit old, but they had developed a methodology for doing that. Uh, the on for all new weapon systems, there is an existing requirement that these costs uh, be considered in developing those weapon systems and in proposing to Congress the cost of, of the, the uh, weapon system, that, that the weapon system would include not just the acquisition but the full life cycle costs, including the disposal. We are, in fact, talking about more than just the environmental liability. There are other costs associated with disposing of these, and we're talking about the full disposal liability. I think also, Mr. Chairman, on the issue of the reliability of the estimates, that, that's really the value of the financial audit process here, that not only will they have to come up with those estimates, and we're trying to work with them and, and with the uh, Inspector General's office so that they can be auditable and we can provide ultimately some assurance to the Congress that the, the estimating process is, is complete, reasonable, uh, and that the cost can be relied upon in making uh, resource determinations, and that also there be disclosure that of when the environmental cost would come due on a, on a, a timeline basis so that it would help better inform the budget decisions that need to be made. Right now, if you don't have that information, you're largely just guesstimating about what your costs are going to be uh, down the road. Just one last question on this, then I'll yield to the gentleman from Ohio. Yes, Mr. Yeah, if Warren. I could just add, the, uh, the House National Security Committee is very interested in this area and held uh, hearings last year as part of their reform package uh, for the Department of Defense. And uh, they're very cognizant that ultimately when these liabilities uh, come due, they're going to be paid out of one of their accounts, principally uh, operations and maintenance. And they're looking for ways to reduce these costs from a front-end uh, standpoint, as Ms. Jacobson pointed out. Uh, so there is a, a, a very uh, good understanding uh, that these decisions that are made up front will cost us dollars in the future, and that we need to uh, act as wisely as we can to reduce them as early as we can in programs. Uh, I I'd be curious as to whether the General Accounting Office and the Inspector General have done any analysis of the office and the decisions in the Department of Defense that relate to the environmental costs on base closures. Uh, have we done some studies on that? And what kind of estimates have we found there? My impression is that not much is happening in terms of actual cleanup. I mean, some nice studies are being done. But I'd be curious what kind of cleanup is going on in terms of these bases, which were often given by a city or a county or a state to the military at the time of the First World War, or the Second World War, Korea. And they said, oh, just pay us a dollar, you know, patriotism. 
and now to get it back so they can either put it into industrial use or schools or whatever, industrial use, maybe you can brownfield it and hope that nobody gets hurt. If it's a school or a neighborhood, you've got a serious problem. What is uh, that adding to the environmental we, we, costs we, here? Uh, we are, in fact, looking at that. Uh, the, right now, the, the number stands at about $7.2 uh, billion that has been um, uh, appropriated, and a good portion of that has, in fact, been obligated for the cleanup of closing bases. Now, it has been obligated? Uh, a good portion of it, yes, sir. Well, what is that? A good is half? Uh, no, oh, I'm talking the 80 to 90 percent. I could provide you the pro uh, precise yeah. uh, percentage uh, the, for the, the record. The 7.2 billion is the figure. And 7, so 7.2, sir, yeah, to this seven, point. Okay, and that 80 percent has been allocated. And I can give the precise. Good. Yes. like to have it. We'll put it in the record at this point. Uh, but your, your statement regard, uh, in the early phases uh, of those programs, much money, as in the uh, normal cleanup programs at the active basis, uh, were devoted to studies. Uh, we do see a, a, a turning of the corner at this point in time where more funds are, are starting to move to the actual uh, cleanup of those facilities. Uh, much of this gets tied up in, as you, as you referenced, uh, to the actual use that's going to be made of that property uh, once the local reuse authority decides uh, how a particular area is going to be used. And that, in fact, in many cases has held up uh, the actual cleanup decision. Very good. I yield uh, 15 minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kusinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I want to uh, <coughs> thank the witnesses uh, for being here today. The, um, as we know, we had a first ever audit of the federal government's books recently completed by the GAO and the inspectors general working with uh, the administration. It was the largest such audit in the history of this country. And it's important, I think, for the American people to know at the outset, so that we can put everything into context here, that uh, many of our government's most important agencies have received uh, clean audit opinions, including uh, the IRS, Social Security, and the Bureau of Public Debt, and other agencies are making progress. Of course, uh, that having been said, it's important that we're here today to review the uh, financial management of the Department of Defense. There is uh, no other area which is more vital to this country than being able to defend this country. Uh, it is a, uh, a, a charge that is as old as this country. Uh, to promoting the common defense is something that is consistent with uh, one of the fundamental purposes of government. Uh, the men and women who work for uh, the Department of Defense, uh, both in this country and are stationed all over the world, deserve our support. And I think one way in which we can support them is to critically analyze the information which is presented to this committee on the uh, audit reports as well as the system analysis of the financial management of the Department of Defense. The, um, uh, because better financial management, it's clear, could save tens of billions of dollars. And since uh, we are always in uh, great debate in the Congress about the uh, resources of the federal government, it's uh, critical that an area of our largest expenditures ought to be more carefully evaluated. The, um, uh, b before I get into my questions, I, I must say in response, I think it was uh, Ms. Hill's remarks, that it is disappointing that the Senior Financial Management Oversight Council has not met in more than a year. Uh, because if, if we are looking at uh, a um, uh, at a problem here which involves hundreds of billions of dollars, you would think that someone would be interested who would have the charge of, uh, of, of pursuing some uh, ad advice. And so, um, you know, I would hope that this uh, Senior Financial Management Oversight Council uh, is going to either be reactivated or something put in its place. I, I should add, uh Congressman, that uh, I am told that the plan is to fold that. This is part of eliminating councils and streamlining the various councils within the department, and that the plan is to mold, the, to turn the function of that council and put it under the what's called the Defense Management Council, which, of course, has a broader um, mandate. So um, 
which you know, our, our position obviously is that the finance area has to be emphasized, whether it will be emphasized as much in the Defense Management Council as it was in a separate council, uh, time will tell, but wh whatever, wherever it is, it needs to be emphasized and, and appropriate leadership exercised in that area. Thank you. As I'm uh, reading through these reports from both the um, Inspector General for the Department of Defense as well as the uh, statement of the uh, Comptroller General's office, uh, it strikes me that we have a, um, uh, the kind of cold accounting prose which uh, is instructive, certainly, but it doesn't really get to some of the underlying questions which I think the public needs some answers on. So uh, with that in mind, I'd, I'd like to um, start by asking uh, Mr. Dodaro, in looking at your um, report about deficiencies related to property, plant, and equipment and inventories, I want to quote from it. Uh, you talk about an impairment of DOD's ability to know the location and condition of all of its assets, including those used for deployment. Um, this report basically says that there are weapons systems or, 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 wep or materiel that we don't know where it is. Is that correct? I mean, uh, basically, uh, what it says is that the department is not able to generate the type of information that can provide assurance that it knows exactly where everything is located and there are problems with items in transit. Uh, probably the, uh, the one of the best indications uh, this year was the test that Ms. Hill mentioned that uh, our offices jointly conducted to go to the individual uh, logistical systems that are used to generate and roll up the information across the, at least at the Army and the Air Force. Uh, it's been known, for example, in the past, Congressman, that the Army systems that w and the Air Force systems that have uh, information on worldwide visibility of the assets. In other words, they're supposed to uh, properly account for all the assets uh, of the Army and the Air Force had uh, a number of errors in them that could not be relied upon. So we went down to the individual systems, picked about 1,800 items uh, in the Army, uh, the Air Force, and the Navy, and actually the Army and the uh, Air Force uh, passed uh, their tests, as Ms. Hill noted, but the Navy, which has about approximately half of all the assets in, in the Department of Defense, uh, failed in three of the uh, 11 categories. Uh, and basically these had to do with uninstalled engines. And not only in, in the case of the Navy uh, did they fail by one or two, but they failed by large margins in, in two of these three Category. So, so there are problems. And, and my well, comment. Well, if, if, if yeah. I may, sir, you, you yeah, know, sure. the, the concept of pass fail uh, is interesting uh, from a university standpoint. I know uh, Mr. Horn's a professor, and I've taught at the university level. I grade on an absolute, as you know, I think. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I, note, I note that. And, uh, and there are times when it's appropriate to grade on an absolute. When we're talking about. Uh, 600 and some billion dollars of, of assets, I think that an absolute grade is something that's more instructive than pass-fail because the pass-fail method, while for public relations purposes is less painful for the taxpayers, uh, might not really reveal the kind of information that would be instructive. I'd like to quote for a moment, if I may, sure. from this report from the um, uh, from Mr. Dodaro, because I think it's an important report. And I, will, and I will allow, as Ms. Hill said, we've had problems for 217 years, as you say, ever since the Department of Defense was created. Okay, we, let's say that's your disclaimer. But now, let's look at the internal workings of, of the Department and quoting from uh, this report uh, which I just did a moment ago about not really knowing the location and uh, condition of all assets. Uh, the um, uh, Navy systems failed for three of the 11 categories of tested military equipment, active boats, uh, which means that there are some boats, I take it, that, that have not been accounted for. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, it goes on. 
It talks about um, assets which are not reflected in the central system, translated. I uh, can't account for howitzer cannons, M16 rifles, and cargo trucks. Um, a uh, missile launcher for an Avenger weapon system that could not be located. Uh, this is the lightweight, high mobile surface to air missile system. Uh, it costs about a million dollars. Uh, findings in the uh, Air Force include uh, over 200 ground launch cruise missiles were identified in the assignment table that were not included in, in either of the other central system databases. Now, you go on to say that these missiles were destroyed years ago as part of the treaty with the Soviet Union, but there's still a problem with accounting here. Uh, Twenty-five aircraft and eight launched cruise missiles were included in the central system inventory and assignment tables, but were not in the possession tables, which to me seems like you don't have them, because if that's what possession means. And on and on, uh, what, uh, Mr. Dodaro, what, uh, what the, what's the quantity of the assets that you would estimate uh, in terms of dollar value, which cannot be located? Do you have a dollar value? Uh, or cannot be accounted yeah. for? Yeah. Basically, it's uh, not possible to determine at this point because of the, of the records. As, as indicated in our, our testimony in the reports of the Inspector General, and I'll ask, you know, uh, maybe, maybe Ms. Hill would, would uh, be able to answer, but I, basically the uh, audit process has found error rates that have prevented us and, or prevented the department from accurately reporting total amounts. That's also prevented us from doing a lot of statistical sampling because you don't have good records to sample from. Uh, but that it's really not possible. I mean, the, 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 to to determine exactly, uh, I believe the the specific answer to your question. The 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 process is intended to assure that what has been reported is accurate, and the records are such that they're either erroneous, documentation's not there uh, to prevent anybody from determining exactly whether or not the information is correct or not. Most of my constituents own a, uh, a house and a car. If they uh, came home one day and the car was missing, it would be a big event. Uh, the car might be analogous to the budget of the Department of Defense or the materiel of the Department of Defense. Uh, it ought to be a big event in, the, in this nation that military equipment can't be accounted for. Um, because it raises the specter of theft, which you admit is a possibility, of black market sales of uh, powerful armaments, which we know is a possibility, of the arming of, of groups around the world, which we end up having to fight and they have our own weapons, which we know uh, has happened in the past. I guess the underlying question here, Mr. Chairman, is this. If, um, if, if the accounting of the Department of Defense, which is different from accounting in, in other areas because we're talking about weapons systems here, if the, if the accounting of the Department of, of Defense is so uncertain and in some cases appears to be in a shambles and always has been, it really raises some, some profound questions about the national defense and about how How safe are we? I mean, if we, can, if we don't know where equipment is, what does that say about logistical support? What does that say about our ability to support troops in the field if they need something? I mean, there are, yeah, there are implications right. here to this. Yes, exactly, Congressman. In fact, uh, in the uh, Army's case, you know, we cite this, uh, uh, it's called the CBSX system, which is their worldwide asset visibility system. When they were equipping troops in Operation Desert Storm, uh, they found that in some cases some of the troops got more equipment than what they needed and some didn't get all the uh, information available. I think, you know, the issue here is that, <clears throat> you know, the, the uh, Defense Department 
can, can provide and properly equip. The question is, is it done in the most efficient manner and can you, you know, properly account for everything? And that, that's where the problems come into play. But it can have I, I, listen, the type I, of uh, implications that I, you're talking about. I will say this, that Mr. Chairman, I had the opportunity uh, a few months ago to uh, uh, go to Bosnia and surrounding areas to visit troops in the field and to meet with commanders and generals. And I was very impressed with the level of professionalism uh, in our Army. Uh, very impressed. And uh, I think it's characteristic of the professionalism which we have in the armed services overall. The uh, accounting work, which really is a support service, uh, is something that, well, the individual soldiers can't really worry about. It does affect their existence out there in the field. Uh, th that's why I, I you know, in, on one hand, uh, you know, the, the Department of Defense can't be like the weather where, where uh, everybody complains about it, but nobody does anything about it. You can't do anything about it. Because we're talking about a tremendous amount of resources dedicated in this country for defense at the cost of health and education and some other things. Now, there are those of us in the Congress who have been debating this issue and the allocation of resources for a long time. And reports like this don't give us any comfort. Um, I, I, you know, I don't, there aren't any real answers, in effect, is what you're, you're trying to clean up accounting, uh, you're trying to locate things, you're trying to do better, but I'm just wondering as you get into, uh, if your accounting is already a shambles, we already know that the year 2000 is going to bring a whole new set of challenges for the uh, Department of Defense. It raises questions as to why you just shouldn't, you know, scrap everything you have and start over. Because it isn't too far away from where you are right now where you, you don't really know. I mean, we have a system of checks and balances here. Uh, we're helping to write the checks in the Congress, and the DOD doesn't know what the balance is. And so I'm, um, you know, this is, this is an eye-opener, Mr. Chairman, to have a chance to look through this. And I, 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 I commend the Chair for calling this hearing because uh, the uh, people of this country uh, ought to know that while we, we do have a professional army, uh, we uh, perhaps need an army of accountants <coughs> to uh, support their work in the field. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Congressman Kucinich, let me just add on there. I, the uh, Inspector General offices in our office have made a lot of specific recommendations that I think can help in the short term. For example, reconciling local records with these central records. So I think there are things, steps that could be taken to make some improvements to improve the integrity of the data. And we're uh, making recommendations and solutions to try to bring that about. So I just wanted to, to make that point. I, you know, I, I have think. confidence in the people who are here that you're, you want to make it better. You know, you've had the first ever audit, and it seems like many other areas of the government are working better. And, and, I, and it's wonderful. This, you know, I, I feel that this is so big that it could cause us to just say, well, you know, and treat it, and treat it as casually. Uh, I, I look at this report, and uh, if, I, if I wasn't uh, seated in a stable chair, I'd probably fall over uh, because of the uh, lack of accountability for hundreds of billions of dollars. So uh, I'm, you know, I can tell you, I'm, I'd rather be on this side of the mic than the side that, that, that you're on, and, uh, but I'm, and I'm glad to be here with the chair so that we can try to find ways of of improving accountability. Thank you. Well, I thank the gentleman. <clears throat> Yield myself 15 minutes now. Uh, two years ago, when we found out they had $25 billion worth of something that they couldn't quite tie down, the answer was, uh, I said, well, what do you think happened to it? Well, we don't think anybody stole it. We just can't find it. And uh, we will have the defense witness who's been working on this for two years, obviously, before us. but is your observation that they have pursued this matter seriously as far as the Inspector General's review and the General Accounting Office review? It, has defense taken this as a serious matter? Because as I listened to the fact that some units had more than their authorized supply, going through my mind was, boy, there was a good master sergeant in that unit that made sure his people or her people were taken care of should they be going into combat. And they might well have been swapping stuff all over the world. Who knows? And fudging up the inventory book. 
but a lot of them are doing it to make sure they have enough firepower, they have enough logistical power, carrying power, personnel carriers, so forth. So what's your reaction? Do you think they took us seriously two years ago, or are they just saying, oh, well, they'll go away sometime? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, are you referring to the problem disbursements of $25 billion yeah, in problem Yeah, 25 billion bucks in the Columbus Processing right. Center, which right. until now I have not mentioned, which was spewing checks out all over America right. to the tune of millions of dollars when they didn't even have a contract with the government. Now, I'm going to ask Ms. Jacobson to give you know, GAO's view. Well, I, I do think that they've taken it very seriously. There are a tremendous number of efforts, and, and in some way that may be a little bit of our criticism, is that th it, it hasn't been a coordinated effort to deal with it. Every, uh, every uh, organization ha who does have this issue within DOD has tried to do something within their organization, um, but that, it, that efforts, those efforts haven't been very well coordinated, so how they have addressed it hasn't necessarily been that efficient. However, they, I do think that they have made progress in the area, but the number still stands at $22 billion, and that's because your $25 billion was significantly understated. Uh, they were not reporting, and they still don't report all of the um, problem disbursements that, that do exist out there. Now, is this simply getting together the acquisition papers, the contracts, and the inventory, or what? No, it, it's a matter of a payment has been made, a check has been written, and now it hasn't been matched in their budgetary or their accounting systems to tell them what they spent it for, uh, it, precisely what it went to, uh, what budgetary account Congress appropriated them the money for that, that should be charged, uh, uh, and uh, uh, what, it, what they bought with it, uh, weapons or inventory or... Um, you know, operational costs. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, mention two topics, some of which are related, some aren't, but they're relevant. First, on the related ones, on the uh, uh, environmental impact of some of these. Around April 2nd, I believe the Washington Post had this story called A Dangerous American Legacy. Subhead, acres of U.S. military land in Panama are littered with unexploded munitions. Now, here we are. We've worked out an agreement with Panama. They are running the canal now. They'll be running it more. But what gets me is it's a very bad image for the American military to withdraw from an area and not clean it up. And here you have little kids being blown up. Now, I was irritated 25 years ago at the American Navy when it withdrew from various Pacific Islands. They had not done their duty either. And I was then on the Civil Rights Commission and raised a little cane. Later, I was on a foundation to try to make up for solving that problem. They left a lot of islands out there without any minimum even thinking about helping them with public health. And that outrages me as an American citizen, I can tell you. So I've got the Navy fiddling around in the Pacific for heaven knows how many years, decades. Well, we took over the German mandate of what the Japanese had taken over. And uh, then we have now the Army in these stories. And you've got, uh, in the last 20 years, nearly two dozen Panamanians have been killed and many others injured on or near the U.S. military's three practice ranges by explosives that detonated after being stepped on or picked up. Panama's foreign ministry said four years ago, a member of the U.S. Navy SEALs was badly injured during maneuvers when a discarded shell exploded under his feet. So we have friendly fire there, very unfriendly fire. And uh, have we looked at those uh, at all in the inspector general's office as to what they're doing about that? Uh, we haven't looked at that particular story. We have on occasion looked at incidences. Uh, I, the most recent that I recall is we looked at some problems with, uh, with the Defense Re Reutilization Market Service when they are disposing of surplus equipment, military equipment, and there were some problems out west where one of those that uh, supposedly had been demilitarized was not demilitarized and exploded and there was an injury. So we did look at that, prop that system and whether or not there were adequate controls on making sure that that equipment 
equipment really was demilitarized before it was, in that case, sold to the public or contractors. And in fact, there were problems. There were problems with the coding of the, de the demilitarization codes. Uh, we issued an audit report and made recommendations. And I, I know, at least in that instance, the Department was quite concerned about that because it, it was, uh, in fact, there had been an injury to a, a non-DOD person, a, a civilian. So. Well, let me move to another example. That's today's Washington Times. The computer hackers could disable military. The lead paragraph by Mr. Gertz is senior Pentagon leaders were stunned by a military exercise showing how easy it is for hackers to cripple U.S. military and civilian computer networks, according to new details of the secret exercise. Using software obtained easily from hacker sites on the Internet, a group of national security agency officials could have shut down the U.S. electric power grid within days and rendered impotent the command and control elements of the U.S. Pacific Command, said officials familiar with the war game known as eligible receiver. I love those Pentagon titles. It's marvelous. The attack was actually run in a two-week period, and the results were frightening, said a defense official involved in the game. I'm curious, was the Inspector General's office involved in this at all? That particular one, we were not. Um, yeah. I will say on that subject, though, Mr. Chairman, that uh, it, is an, it is a very serious problem. And uh, we, uh, I think DISA, the Defense Information Systems Agency, estimated in 1995 that there were 250,000 attacks annually on DOD systems. Uh, and I'm told that's increased in the last two years. What is uh, very scary about it is that the, the percent of those that are detected and reported is minuscule. And uh, this is a very serious problem. It's been uh, raised to the forefront, I would say, within the last year on a couple of fronts. At, within our shop, uh, our criminal investigators, we, the Defense Criminal Investigative Service is part of the OIG, and uh, we have uh, partly my pushing and their recognition of this as a, a growing area, not only for defense but for all agencies, we have actually raised a, uh, a unit in that service of people who are going to be trained in computer intrusion cases. And they, are, in fact, are working closely with the Defense Information Systems Agency in the agency to be there to detect and to follow up on the criminal side, criminal cases. In addition, as I think you may know, the FBI is heading up what's called the National Infrastructure Protection Center, which is a recent innovation. Uh, it is designed, although the FBI, I believe, is heading it and the Justice Department plays a heavy role, it is going to have agency reps from many different agencies and there's going to be a substantial contingent from the Department of Defense. Our people are working with uh, that agency and they're working closely with the FBI and, of course, the whole purpose of setting that center up is to government-wide bring in information on computer intrusions and uh, raise our level of expertise uh, in law enforcement, and not just in law enforcement, on the detection and the prevention aspect, too, not only the reaction. So it's, there's a lot of activity right now in that area. Um, my own view is you can't have too much activity because it is a horrible, horribly uh, great problem and it's likely to get bigger because the hackers you are talking about, uh, we don't know the extent. Uh, it's growing. And uh, the scary thing is that the tools they use to do this are tools that are available to millions of people on the Internet. So it's, it's, it's a very real problem. Well, is, is the department building firewalls within so those internal systems cannot be accessed? Yes. They, that we have done many, many audits and much work on this whole area of information security, uh, technology security, and uh, we've done it on very different systems. Um, we've made recommendations. There was one where we made recommendation on a firewall. They, they, do, are, they are responding to our recommendations. Um, so there is a lot of work going on in that area. Um, that's not to say that the problem is fixed, and I, I wouldn't want to mislead you and tell you all those systems are secure because there are obviously major problems out there. Um, but I do think uh, the incidents you've cited and other recent incidents have gotten people's attentions and uh, also with the creation of the center and the FBI's involvement, and uh, we're, we're working closely with them and trying to get up our own act to speed in our shop. 
Uh, I can also, on a broader scale, tell you this is an issue that has raised, been raised among all the inspectors general, not just at defense, uh, at the President's Council on Integrity and Efficiency, which I'm the vice chair. This is an issue we've talked about and are trying to, uh, in fact, we just had the, earlier this week a presentation by the FBI on their capability and their wish to work closer with all the IGs uh, to, to get this problem, you know, manageable across government, not yeah. just at DOD. Do we know the extent to which outside hackers have fiddled around with the accounting systems in the Pentagon as opposed to different computing systems that aren't accounting? No, we, we don't. We uh, Basically, the best estimates we have are the DISA estimates, which are that there are a huge number of attacks across the board. I don't think they've narrowed it down to type of system. But generally speaking, it's a very large number of intrusions. It's a very uh, a good size success rate as far as getting into the systems. And at, at present, there is a very small detection rate and reporting rate, which is crucial if you're going to follow up from a prosecution standpoint. Well, in this example where the National Security Agency tried this and were successful, the only group that they used out of several dozen was the group based in the United States. They did catch that one somehow, but they didn't catch the attacks from overseas or offshore. Has the General Accounting Office got any views on this? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in uh, February 1997, we designated computer security across the federal government as a high-risk area. Now, in the Department of Defense in particular, we issued two reports in 1996, one on the vulnerabilities to outside hackers coming in. And one of the th reasons defense is more vulnerable than a lot of other agencies is because they've made great use of the Internet. And because of that, they, and they have not developed a comprehensive security program to make sure that they control all and know where all the Internet access points really are to their dep uh, department. Uh, we also issued a report that was limited to official use only of problems with authorized users within the Defense Department itself and among its contractors, which is another area of vulnerability uh, considerably. In that uh, report, we identified about 250 specific weaknesses. And this is back in 1996. They've corrected about half of them. We're following up on those areas right now. But like uh, Ms. Hill's earlier point, the uh, decentralized management structure for computer security has been a, a problem, and our recommendations have been to have more of a coordinated department-wide strategy uh, to train some of the users, to have an incident reporting capability so you can monitor it. This is now set up that capability. So there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with uh, Ms. Hill's assessment that this is a, a very, very serious uh, problem uh, that needs uh, vigilant attention. And as I mentioned, also before the subcommittee when talking about the year 2000 problem, the year 2000 problem has the potential to accentuate uh, these vulnerabilities because you will be making uh, in a compressed time schedule so many changes to your computer systems that I'm concerned that the security aspects of those uh, uh, systems concerns are going to be uh, short changed because of the pressures to get the software changes in place before the year 2000. So we need to be especially careful over the next couple of years with our computer uh, systems throughout the government and especially in the Defense Department. Well, I appreciate that statement. Let me give you another example, and then we'll close out this, and I'll yield to the gentleman from Ohio. Here on March 12, 1997, in the Chicago Tribune, this story appeared. Headline, Wisconsin man guilty in theft of tank, equipment from Fort McCoy. Lead, a military surplus dealer was convicted Tuesday of masterminding the biggest theft of fighting equipment ever from a United States base, a $13 million heist from the Wisconsin Army Reserve Camp that included a tank and 17 armored personnel carriers. Now, Leo Anthony Pyatt's nicknamed Tanker Tony was found guilty on all counts of conspiracy, bribery, and conversion of government property. In brief, crime does not pay, at least with this one. Prosecutor said Pyatt's, age 37 of Hudson, used bribes, phony documents, and six accomplices to drive off with at least 153 vehicles from Fort McCoy, 
you know, can't you just see them sort of waving at the gate? I mean, what are those MPs for at the gate? Uh, 95 miles northwest of Madison, five others charged in the scheme face trial in June. In addition to a Vietnam-era Sheridan, Sheridan uh, tank and the uh, personnel carriers, the stolen vehicles included an airport runway snowblower truck, a crane, and other heavy equipment. They were taken between 1994 and 1996. I won't go into all of this, but some of it went to museums. Some of it went to ski lodges. And I guess my curiosity is, you look at CIA and Ames, a lot of cash was going to him for what he was giving in secrets. Does anybody do checks on some of the people that are involved with logistics, with inventory, with warehousing? Uh, has anybody looked to see if they're living in a 17-bedroom home somewhere or what? Uh, what is the Pentagon's approach on that one? Well, that, that case I'm very familiar with because that is one, actually that case was done by our Defense Criminal Investigative Service along with the FBI, I believe. It was a joint criminal investigation. Um, as far as looking at the, and you're right, that I, as I recall the facts of that case, it was really a bribery. They were basically yeah. paying off to get access to that equipment. Um, the, looking at the finance, whether a person is living beyond their means, that sort of thing generally comes into play in the security clearance area. So it would depend on whether or not, um, you know, that's an issue that they usually focus on doing security clearance, background investigations, re reinvestigations, that sort of thing. I do not know offhand if those types of individuals, what kinds of clearances in that case they had. It would really depend on the clearance level. If it was a lower level employee that probably had no access to any classified information, my guess is they probably, uh, you know, don't keep a running track of that other than the, the usual colleagues that the person works with may be surprised if they see something odd and that sort of thing. Um, and of course we do, I should say. Uh, we run the hotline also at Defense, and sometimes we do get tips like that that come through the hotline from people working with individuals that look, see something suspicious, that sort of thing. But the, the, the real focused review of a person's financial status comes in the security clearance backgrounds. I might add, Mr. Chairman, that Senator McCain has had us looking intensively at the controls in the disposal system uh, for the last two years, and, and there, there is a body of, of products on that subject. Uh, essentially, this is an area that is extremely difficult to, uh, to eliminate fraud in. There's always going to be a risk uh, because of its very nature. But I think we have um, essentially good controls in place. The, the problem is getting everyone to comply with the procedures that are in place. And you, you are going to have some leakage out of the system from time to time. This, I guess, is considered a success story because the culprits were identified. And we do have a lot of, of criminal investigative activity coming out of the disposal process. There have been quite a few indictments and convictions over the last several years. Right. That, that is really a growing area of activity for DCIS. And mostly it's fraud and diversion of surplus and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Has GAO done any review on this in terms of inventory control and uh, regardless of whether it's the Pentagon, we can look at GSA. I mean, they've got huge inventories around the United States as to whether some of the stuff is just missing. We, we, we've generally looked at theft cases over the years, and I would uh, uh, echo what's already been said on this issue. It's, it's a very difficult issue because the system is dependent. Uh, it's highly decentralized first. Uh, to, to the local bases and activities, and then it's dependent on the set of controls that are in place, and then furthermore dependent on the group of people that are, in fact, administering those controls to do the right thing. Uh, so it becomes a very difficult process to identify. Uh, we have been most successful in going in and, and taking a look and doing, in essence, compliance reviews to find out that if that's occurring. Where we've become disappointed is typically when we go in and do that type of thing, we find that the set of controls that are, that are in fact in place are in fact not being followed. A good example is another Marine Corps example in last October where uh, the property book office uh, that was controlling equipment that was going to be going to the training ranges properly signed it out, did all the things that they were supposed to do to provide it to the troops, 
Uh, but when the folks got to the ranges, instead of expending that material, they, they just kept it and walked off of the base with it. Uh, there was a control in place. Somebody was supposed to be checking at the range to make sure that that didn't happen. You had a breakdown in controls, and, and therefore it, it, the material was lost. Uh, the point that I want to go with this is a, a point that I think has been made earlier, that there's got to be a top-to-bottom commitment uh, a leadership, and this is from the civilian through the military chain, to put these controls in place in a highly decentralized system if it's, if it's going to work. And uh, there's no substitute for that. Well, do you feel that uh, we have that leadership? Do you feel that things are beginning to happen? In a I, I w I'm most system. familiar with the Army. For example, the Army had some severe problems several years ago, and I think they put in a very effective program uh, uh, to, to make that happen, and I think it, it uh, re um, uh, bore some very good results. I'm not so sure that that's occurring across some of the other services mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I, I think the, the basic uh, tie-in back to the financial audit and the, and the look of controls is that there are that audit focuses on the basic checks and balances. You know, is the inventory match the records? The, 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 the property books match the central system, so you have that type of check and balance in place. And what we find, what the Inspector General Office has found, is that overall check and balance is not working properly. And then you have the sort of subset of controls at individual locations that we're talking about in the decentralized nature. But until you get that whole control structure operating effectively, you don't have an efficient way to, to do this year in and year out, and that's the value of the audits. If you're totally relying on tips uh, from, from people, you're never going to be able to prevent it. And, and part of the effort in the financial audit is to, is to identify ways to prevent these things from happening and to provide that sort of discipline year in and year out to have uh, the proper control system in place and follow. And I, and I agree with all the comments that have been made. Typically at DOD, the, the policies are there. Uh, it, it's the application and the follow-through to ensure that they're being complied with that is really where the breakdown occurs. I remember uh, when uh, we had state auditors, system auditors, all the rest in the university systems, our chief auditor had some good advice. He said, uh, those people that never take a vacation, have them take a vacation. And it's amazing. He cited me numerous examples in another university system in the state that will go nameless. But the, uh, one of the top officials in the university was siphoning off bales of hay to his ranch. And uh, somebody sat in the desk and said, that's an interesting bill. I wonder what that's about. Mm -hmm. And they got him. So there's a lot of ways to get people here. But I just wonder if you feel that we're proceeding in some logical way to check whether we've had major losses? Well, I think uh, clearly there needs to be more commitment to get the broad checks and balances in place yeah. so we can pass the test of an audit. Until you do that, you're really not going to know at the highest level that you've got the entire systems of controls uh, in, in place. Yeah. I yield uh, 20 minutes to my colleague. I've gone past my red light, so if he has that many questions, go to it. I will say that uh, it would be fine with me to listen to the chair's questions for another 20 minutes because I have uh, been uh, getting an education just following your presentation, and I'm uh, glad to be here on this committee to participate with you. I want to return to quoting from the report of uh, Mr. Dodaro because I think that um, it, it helps to continue to focus us on the challenge so that we... Um, uh, give this the proper, proper gravity, respect the moment of this discussion. Quoting from uh, the report, as discussed in our recent report of the, on fiscal year 1997, consolidated financial statements, uh, the federal government, one of the world's largest holders of physical assets, does not have accurate information about the amount of assets held to support its domestic and global operations. Hundreds of billions of dollars of the more than 1.2 trillion of these reported assets are not adequately supported by financial and or logistical records. Quoting further from the report with respect to military equipment accountability and visibility, 
DOD, Department of Defense's investment in military weapons systems represents an estimated $635 billion of the federal government's total property, plant, and equipment reported at about $1 trillion. Accountability over these critical assets entails knowing for each asset category how many exist, where they are located, and their value. Overall, the auditors found that the Department of Defense's logistical systems could not be relied upon to provide this basic information. Under the section, inventory cannot be verified. Quote, Department of Defense inventory includes ammunition such as machine gun cartridges, rocket motors, and grenades, consumables such as clothing, bolts, and medical supplies, stockpile materials such as industrial diamonds, rubber, and tungsten, and repairable items such as navigational computers, landing gear, and hydraulic pumps. Department of Defense's inability, inability to adequate to, excuse me, Department of Defense's inability, inability to effectively account for and control its reported $170 billion investment in inventories has been an ongoing area of major concern. Now, I, I just wanted to uh, read that for emphasis so that we have an understanding of the parameters of the challenge which is before us. Uh, it's also a challenge uh, in, to maintain the confidence of the American taxpayers who yesterday we, we celebrated their uh, yearly anniversary uh, encounter with the uh, Internal Revenue Service. Today we talk about how uh, the bulk of their treasure is being used. Uh, it, it does not provide any comfort, I'm sure, to taxpayers to know that uh, a large, uh, uh, that many serious questions remain about accounting for uh, substantial expense, uh, def uh, substantial defense expenditures. Now, Mr. Dodaro, um, earlier we were talking about not being able to locate certain equipment. H has, have there been any audit findings? Uh, about equipment that eventually was located, which are which the findings of which are now classified in terms of the equipment found its way into any uh, particular hands that the government uh, isn't talking about. And let me ask the, uh, Dave. Do you know? I mean, in, in terms of items that might have been diverted to. Has the CIA ever been involved in any of the in, in follow-up in determining uh, uh, the answer audit? would be yes, but I really couldn't go any further in an unclassified. Well, you answered my question by saying yeah. yes. Well, if I might, of course, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, if I might check, what I heard the gentleman a asking was if there had been a situation such as he described, and these people had been caught, was that case then classified? Uh, now, it wasn't say, we didn't say it was in a classified uh, relationship there where CIA, Army Intelligence, whoever, were involved, but were somebody just trying to keep the outcome of that case, which doesn't tell us a thing, really, about any intelligence operation, but just were they trying to cover up the fact that we have these problems? It's sort of like, no, li I, I'll give you an I, I, analogy, uh, university <coughs> libraries. There are people that steal rare books all the time. The attitude had been 20 years ago, don't ever report it. Well, that's just plain wrong. Once you reported it, you got a lot of help from a lot of people trying to say, hey, these are your books and they're worth $200,000 or $100,000. But they had this sort of code of silence. And I think that's the way I'm listening to the question. Did the, are there anything where you people have exposed something where this is now classified so nobody can look at it unless they've got a top secret clearance or something? My answer would be no. The cases that I'm familiar with uh, I think were uh, classified for appropriate reasons and reported to the appropriate committees that have jurisdiction in that area. What would be the reason? What are the appropriate reasons for classifying as a result of uh, national, audit findings? For national security 
they have national security implications. Okay, so let's let's follow this, Mr. Chairman, and I and I am grateful for your colloquy here, Mr. Chairman, because uh, you've been doing this longer than I have, and it's good to have your experience. I just want to follow this. The uh, audit findings uh, in which the CIA perhaps has been involved in tracking down information uh, subsequently become classified? Um, in, the, in the cases that I'm aware, yes. Yes or no? Yes, they were classified. Okay, yes. and, 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 and the reason is for national security purposes? Yes, sir. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So what that means in drawing out the implications is that, uh, and, and kind of confirming what Mr. Dodaro answered earlier, that we have, uh, that there are instances where, where, where weapons or weapons systems, we don't know which because we're talking about something that's classified here, got out of the control of the United States because if the CIA is involved, you know, this is, since, since they're not, their charge isn't domestic, it's foreign, got out of the charge of the United States and got into the, and, and became under the control of some elements not connected with the United States, presumably. Um, see, because this has foreign policy implications and, and your work here well, it's, 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 it's very important and much appreciated. We have to look to the implications of what we're finding out here. If you have poor accounting systems, it raises questions about logistics and our ability to support the mission of our armed services, both domestically and globally. If you have weapon systems that or weapons which have been missing. And you have just said that the CIA was involved. The implications of that would be that certain material from the Department of Defense has fallen into hands of people who may not necessarily be friendly to the United States of America. I, I, I think this would give all of us a certain amount of pause and again, I'm, um, I respect the fact that you can only say so much uh, uh, because there, are some in, there is some information classified here. Uh, but uh, is, there, is there a, uh, uh, Mr. Darrell, uh, how often, or, or do, let me start over, do you have, are there reports available which can trace a weapon system or, or a, a major weapon that went uh, from procurement wasn't received or in possession and then found its way out of the country. Uh, do, do you keep a list about these things? Do you, do, do you, do you track these things? Yeah, I, I do not know the answer to that question. Uh, and I would have to, uh, to Is there anybody to here that knows the answer to that question? I, I'm not aware of the instances they're referring to, so. Is that in your bailiwick to answer that question? Well, you're I. You're not aware, but I mean, are you qualified to say you're not I'm aware not, based I mean, on I that question? I mean, I certainly am not aware of everything that happens in the Department of Defense, that's for sure. Well, I mean, that's established from, you know, everyone here, but yeah. that's. That's not my point. If I, if I might, Please. Uh, I think this is a pertinent time to say what are the various inspector generals of the various services doing? Do they primarily handle these cases? And is there coordination with your office? Are you aware well, of their closure on particular cases? We, we work closely with the service IGs. They have a slightly different uh, mission than we do. They work with us on a number of different issues, including, for instance, whistleblower reprisal cases, all sorts of things. They, um, so we keep in contact with them on senior official investigations. We don't keep in contact with them on everything they do, certainly. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, if the congressman is talking about a criminal investigation of where, a we if there was some information that a weapon system had been diverted to a foreign country and there was a criminal investigation on, then our criminal people would probably be involved with that, or the FBI would. Um, 
all I'm saying is that I'm not aware of any audit reports that became classified and that the reason they were classified was because there had been a diversion of some weapon system that went overseas or out of the country that, that was lost or that sort of thing. Um, and I just I don't want to leave the impression that we were aware of such a thing because I'm not and Mr. Lieberman no, is not. I mean, we, we see all audit reports done in defense and in the last 10 years I've never seen one that followed that scenario. Are you aware of the CIA doing follow-up on, on uh, auditing of? No, sir. Mr. Warren said that you are. Is, it, is that correct? Are, are you well, aware of the CIA following? I didn't say the department. I, said, I thought the question to me was, I aware of any instances? And, and my answer was yes. So Mr. Oh, Warren is aware. But these were, th I'm, let me correct, this was through GAO's work. I, I understand. Okay. I mean, I, you know, but I don't want to get. I don't want to get the bureaucracy um, pitted against each other here. I'm right. looking for the truth of a matter. Right. So you might not be aware, but someone is. Right. And so I'm, I'm not is. saying that because right. we're not aware of it, Thank it doesn't you. exist. Thank you. But if someone is aware, if you're not aware, but someone is aware, you may just not know. That's, that's that doesn't mean it didn't, it, That doesn't yes. mean it didn't happen. Yeah. I just want to establish for the record here. Right. Because I, I'm uh, particularly concerned uh, to know not only that that we have accounting problems in the Department of Defense, which uh, could result in, in weapons being uh, stolen or diverted to a black market. But also, I'm, in, I'm interested in the foreign policy implications of what happens if weapons are diverted. And since the Central Intelligence Agency must know something about this, uh, they probably would be the ones most appropriately to question about it, and it goes beyond the scope of this particular hearing. However, it comes up in this hearing because we're talking about accounting. Yeah. So I, I'm... Yes, now, Mr. There, there are uh, annual summary reports, as I understand, from the uh, Defense Investigative Services dealing with theft of military inventory, and, and data is available on a regular basis in terms of the number of... Uh, 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 thefts that have been reported and, and, and in fact are being pursued on an annual basis. So that information, I think, is routinely available. Yes, and there's information available on uh, items that ended up in foreign countries. But your specific question went to U.S. intelligence agency involvement. Exactly. Right. Because that has a different meaning. Yes. Not just about what ends up in different countries. Yes. Except for a lot of reasons. There's contractors right. all over the globe. Right. Contractors could hold on to material. You have a reporter that says you have $90 billion uh, involving contractors in, in your accounting discussions here. It's not what I'm talking about. You know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Right. And I uh, uh, just wanted to make sure that we brought this forward on the public record. I, I just have a couple more questions here um, the, um, uh, to Inspector General Hill. Uh, according to your testimony, the Department of Defense uh, made a number of of very substantial unsupported adjustments in its books, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars mm -hmm. worth. Tell us what an adjustment is. What do you mean by adjustment? Well, it means with the figure, in other words, when they are matching up accounts, DFAS, for instance, would be matching, for instance, DFAS, DFAS is Defense Finance and Accounting Service, and they right. have several centers throughout the country, and they do most of the accounting for the department. It goes through DFAS, much of it, and they would be trying to reconcile, for instance, I think the one example we cited was the Air Force General Ledger, so the Air Force books, the Air Force accounting with the counting they have on the appropriation counts. And in order to make those match, they will make adjustments up or down. In other words, an adjustment can be a plus up or it could be a, a, a decrease in the figure. And what, when the figures we give you are run in the billions, I think some of the ones we said, that's the total figure of the adjustments, plus and minus, that they have made to those accounts over the course of whatever time period we reference. What we're trying to show is how poor the flow of information is. There, there should be minimal changes necessary when the financial statements are put together. But our systems don't talk to each other very well, and therefore you have all of these errors that are corrected in, in some cases several times over back and forth trying to get the same line. Okay, well, balance. going back to, uh, to Ms. Hill, you spoke uh, in your testimony, I think, about the defense finance accounting services. 
Right. Uh, didn't have supporting documentation for adjustments totaling about $217 right. billion. And, and, and well, what, what, it, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that when we went in and looked at the adjustments they had made, and obviously they were making adjustments because the figures weren't matching, so that, that alone tells you there was poor information, as Mr. Lieberman says. When we came in and reviewed the adjustments and what was the justification for the adjustment, why did they make it, we couldn't find supporting documentation to convince us that it was a valid adjustment, in other words, to support the fact that they either plussed it up or decreased it. Okay, I, I would. Uh, so it's all. It all goes back to no poor information. They have very, I, I very poor information. And I, I understand that. Now, um, I think you mentioned that a third of your staff will be engaged in uh, CFO Act audits by the year 2002. Right. Uh, could you give us a summary of your budget and uh, the downsizing trend your office is facing? Yeah. Uh, we are the IG, and of course our, the OIG at Defense covers more than audit. We have, right. as I mentioned, the criminal investigators, administrative investigators, policy on criminal investigations and audit. We are undergoing a program budget reduction. We will be decreasing by about 37 percent in personnel from uh, the year 1995 to 2001. Um, so we will end up, right now I think we're about 1270 and we'll end up about 1,059 people in the year 2001. And the predictions on the CFO, obviously as we downsize, we are not, we, we don't want to give up the quality of what we're going to do, so we're going to be doing less of what we do. And we're trying to keep to our core functions. When we look at what we have to cut, we cannot cut our CFO work because it's statutorily mandated. So that is going to be taking a bigger and bigger chunk of our resources, which is going to leave us with less resources to do risk assessments and um, many other things, uh, management requests, congressional requests, et cetera. So it is going to have an impact on our ability to cover some other high-risk areas in the department. Years ago, I remember looking at uh, uh, cartoon pictures which would ask you to identify 10 things wrong with this picture. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to look and find things that are wrong with this picture. Right. Uh, today you presented us with a picture of, of a massive uh, inability of the Department of Defense to adequately account for hundreds of billions of dollars in assets. We learned of uh, hackers who are in 1995, I believe it was, over 250,000 passes were made at the computer systems, uh, some of which have the ability to rearrange data. Uh, we're looking at the year 2000 and the implications of uh, the um, impact on the computer systems and the information in those systems if the systems were perfect, which they're not. Now, on top of that, Mr. Chairman, we are now hearing testimony that uh, one of the agencies charged with the authority to let the American people know what's going on is facing a reduction in their budget. <laughs> uh, I, I think that based on the testimony that we've had here today, uh, the, uh, such a reduction is not uh, only not warranted, but it is against the interests of the American taxpayers because if if we know that we're right on the threshold of breaking through and, res and, and finally attacking uh, what's been a centuries-old mess of Department of Defense accounting, it seems the last thing we'd be doing is to uh, attack uh, one of the offices which can protect the resources of the American taxpayers. So uh, that having been said, uh, I, I think that it's, uh, it's appropriate for members of this committee to uh, take that up with the administration as well as with the relevant congressional um, authorizing committees to uh, discuss this information which we have brought to us today. I, I thank you very much for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the witnesses, too. Well, I uh, thank you. It's <clears throat> a very useful series of questions. I didn't get into a lot of the nitty-gritty here, Mr. Dodaro, that uh, are in your report, but it is rather fascinating in terms of the uh, duplicate record for the helicopters, uh, the uh, <coughs> various missiles, uh, 
which uh, says here on page 10 of the draft, over 200 ground-launched cruise missiles were identified in the assignment table that were not included in either of the other central system databases. According to the system program office, these missiles were destroyed years ago as part of the treaty with the Soviet Union. Now, I realize there's going to be a series of those, but you're saying until you call their attention to it, they hadn't figured out where they were or if they even existed, and then they tracked it down. What was the story on that? I, what we did was a computer match of those three tables which are in that system, and, and one of those tables was inaccurate. Now, there are 1,700 users to that system, and which tables and how they use it uh, we, we're not clear, um, but we felt that the information should be consistent and accurate in all three of them because somebody may be, in fact, looking to that particular table to identify, you know, where these things were and not know that they no longer existed. It is highly unlikely, I would say, in this case that they didn't know uh, that those had been destroyed, but it was just an example of one of the items that we found. But, but basically, Mr. Chairman, the, the, the answer is that the, the data in the systems is inaccurate, and until we do these type of analysis, uh, it's not fixed in the record. And the same thing is true in, in some of those categories of uh, where we find the Navy did not find things. Uh, eventually, things were disposed of or, or, or uh, years earlier, but were still carried on the books as available assets. And there are other issues and, and things that the Inspector General and the Audit Services have found that are in existence that are not on the books. So you have, you have the problem in both directions. You uh, cited the example of a unit that had more equipment uh, than uh, they thought they had based on analysis of what was in the system. Now, were there any of those units that were ever sent into combat or any type of duty where they suddenly realized they didn't have X number of tanks that the system said it had? Well, actually, what I was quoting is a lessons learned report done by the Army uh, after the uh, Operation Desert Storm uh, exercise. So they were actually, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, looking at that and uh, developing a set of observations based upon how that deployment works. So that was actually a, an analysis after the fact of how those troops uh, were, were supported. Lisa, but that is, uh, I would just add no. that that is not the basis. These, this visibility system is not used for that particular purpose of deployment. It is, it is used um, to support deployed units and to provide them with the supplies that they need. But they have other readiness factors and systems that, you, that they use to determine whether uh, a unit is, it has its equipment and is ready for deployment. It, it wouldn't be this system. Just so, so people don't get alarmed. Uh, well, that's what I'm curious about. Did they get into the Gulf and not have the proper equipment that all the charts and accounting devices said they did have? I think it's pretty much this lessons learned report is really kind of going the opposite direction, that because they couldn't rely on this system to tell them exactly what they had, they were pushing a lot more supplies to the units than perhaps they needed. And that was to the detriment of the units that remained behind. Uh, you know, there, there's only limited amount of resources and, and uh, with all of it going to the theater, the, the units that were here were not getting their, what they needed to keep them uh, fully up to speed. Ready, yeah. yeah. Well, does my colleague have any further questions? I think it's about time uh, we brought in the representatives of the Department of Defense. Uh, <clears throat> so I thank you all, and maybe one or two of your staff ought to stay just in case uh, we have a question sure. on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So thank you, Congressman Cassandra. If uh, Mr. Toy will uh, come forward. Nelson Toy is the Deputy Chief Financial Officer of the Department of Defense, and he will be accompanied by Mrs. Eleanor Spector, the Director of Defense Procurement.
Okay, if you uh, don't mind standing and raise your right hand uh, in the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee, you swear it'll be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. The clerk will note both witnesses took the oath and affirmed it. So, uh, Mr. Toy, I assume you've, and Ms. Spector, I assume you've been listening to a lot of this discussion. Yes, sir. Let's start with that question, and then we'll have you go through your statement. But is there anything that comes to mind of what you heard this morning that you'd like to straighten out right now? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I've heard a lot this morning, and there have been a lot in recent GAO and IG reports about DOD's financial management. And I'm not going to say that our financial management records are as clean as we would like them to be. However, I think it's important to understand some of the details because without understanding the details, the characterization of the problems is seen in a much different light. For example, when we talk about billions of dollars of adjustments in financial records, in most instances, what we're talking about is property records that are not maintained in DOD's financial ma management systems. Instead, they are maintained in logistic systems. So when it comes time to do financial statements, these adjustments are merely the entering of information into the financial systems in order to enable them to produce the financial statements. For, for, for example, real property at Fort Hood may not be in DOD's financial records. Instead, they're in logistics records. So that information would need to be entered into the financial system at the end of the year to do the financial statements. Those adjustments can involve hundreds of millions, and in some instances, billions of dollars. And, and so we need to properly characterize many of those so-called adjustments. Additionally, some of the other examples that were given this morning with regard to property or inventory items uh, are really a reflection of the paperwork not keeping pace in a number of instances with the physical movement of property from one location to another. This is not to imply that the department does not have good information, does not know where its property and its equipment is located. It does mean, however, in some instances, that our property records are simply not up to date. In part, this is um, similar to an example that I think was given this morning about an automobile and somebody asks you about your automobile, and it's sitting out in the driveway, and you know it's yours, and you've had it for 10 years, and, and it has your license plate on it, but the auditors come in, and they ask you to produ produce a registration, and you cannot produce that registration. Maybe it's, it's um, upstairs, maybe it's fallen out of your wallet, and you cannot produce the registration, so you cannot, um, convince the auditors that that automobile is yours, but that does not mean that you've lost control of the automobile. What it means is there's a documentation problem that needs to be resolved. And that is um, the case with many of the property issues that have been cited in recent audit reports. Okay. Uh, do you want to uh, make your uh, statement, give us the overall view of it? Yes, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I have a very short um, statement that, that, that I would like to read. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to say that it is a pleasure to uh, appear here today to discuss with this committee DOD's financial management operations. Now, do recall that you are under oath when you say it's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Department is in the process of undertaking the most comprehensive reform of financial management systems and practices in the Department's history. Progress has been substantial, but much more work lies ahead. 
In 1994, the department's financial management operations were conducted at over 330 failed installations of sites. Since then, the department has consolidated its financial operations into five centers in 21 op operating locations. In the process, the department has been able to eliminate redundancy, eliminate unnecessary management layers, facilitate standardization of, of information, improve the accuracy and timeliness of its financial operations, increase productivity, and realize considerable savings. The department also has eliminated and will continue to eliminate outdated financial management systems. The department currently has 156 finance and accounting systems compared to 324 such systems in 1991. The long-term goal is to reduce the number of DOD finance and accounting systems to about 32. Simultaneously, the department also has been improving the remaining systems to make them capable of providing more accurate and timely financial management information that will better permit the department to produce auditable financial statements. However, during the past few years, additional accounting requirements have been imposed on all federal agencies, including the Department of Defense. This is equivalent to moving the go line during, during the course of the game. These new requirements necessitate even more substantial changes to the department's financial management operations processes and systems. The department is implementing the required changes, but progress is slow. In part, this is because of the size and the diversity of the Department of Defense. There is no other organization in the nation, perhaps in the world, which is as large and diverse as the Department of Defense. The department operates in excess of 100,000 weapon system platforms. It maintains over 500 bases in approximately 150 countries and territories throughout the world. It employs over 2 million active duty and reserve and guard military personnel, as well as over 700,000 civilian employees. The size of the department's three major components, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, dwarfs the largest organization in the private sector as well as most other federal agencies. In addition to the department's direct warfighting capabilities, the department also maintains and operates many related support functions. These include a large number of hospitals and health care facilities, a number of shipyards and other depot maintenance facilities, numerous research and development laboratories, extensive transportation capabilities, as well as numerous other functions. And of course, the department's direct military capabilities, as well as the many related functions, support functions, have to be maintained in top operating condition 24 hours a day, 365 days a year in a global environment. What is most important to the department is to be capable of responding and when necessary to respond quickly anywhere in the world with sufficient force to counter events that may threaten the nation's security. Mr. Chairman, I am an accountant. I have spent much of my career working to improve the department's financial management processes. Sound financial management principles are important to me. But I recognize, and I believe that others recognize also, that the primary mission of the Department of Defense is to be able to respond with sufficient force and sufficient time to protect the nation's interest. The department performs that mission very well. The ability to prepare sound financial statements also is important, but it is secondary to protecting the security of the nation. I hope that this committee and the American public will weigh the relative importance of a strong military force that can be deployed rapidly to destinations throughout the world against the ability of the department to provide receipts for property that may have been purchased 20, 30, 40, or 50 or more years ago. 
Before I conclude my opening statement, let me again counter what I believe to be an inaccurate impression that might have been created during testimony earlier this morning. Many of the examples cited by the GAO reflect paperwork not always keeping pace with the physical movement of property, as I mentioned earlier. Despite the impression that may have been created, the department does have control of its assets and is, and is prepared to apply those assets when and where needed, and the department does have the information that it needs to make sound business decisions. I'd be happy to address these and other issues further. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, this concludes my opening statement. I'll be happy to answer any questions you or other members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And let's uh, start with the uh, missing missile launchers, among other things. Now, you've got a whole series of objects that were reported in the consolidated balance sheet statement for the federal government reported in this one. What kind of assurance can you give us that we don't have other things missing that are worth billions of dollars? Because that's quite a bit of things missing, even though you've got a huge inventory. I realize that. But what are our controls okay. on this? And I, I'd like to repeat something that the IG said this morning and, and GAO um, verified, and then I'd like to talk about the, the missile launcher itself. When the auditors went in to verify the accuracy of data in our systems, the Army and the Air Force systems passed that test. Eight of the 11 systems in the Navy pass that test. And we can come back and talk to the, to the issues in the Navy in a minute. With regard to the launcher, I, I want to assure this committee and the American people that the Department of Defense knows where these missile launchers are. The, the Army has over 500 of these particular type of missiles. Would the gentleman yield? Well, OK. Well, uh, why don't you just tell the General Accounting Office then? Thank you. Well, you're saying. L I, I, let like me give you s some background on here. The General Accounting Office did not do the audit of these missiles. That was done by DOD auditors. The, the, what happened in this instance is we had a launcher attached to a Humvee. The Humvee was transferred to one unit. The launcher. It is, the DOD auditors did not raise this as an issue. The GAO auditors came behind the DOD auditors and, in effect, looked over their shoulder and used their work papers. And I believe the characterization that the launcher was missing came from the GAO. When the Department of Defense heard that the GAO was indicating that the, the launcher was missing, we immediately um, contacted the auditors to get some more information on what missile launcher they thought was missing and why they thought it was missing. With that information, we indeed were able to identify the launcher that they were talking about, and then, of course, we could identify what its location was. Did anything change in our accounting for this type of situation where you've got the launcher in one place and the missile in the other? I mean, is this two things we just need to check to not have this experience again? Uh, yes, the, the, there is a lesson here. The, the issue here was the serial number. The serial number for the Humvee was listed as the serial number for the unit, the unit being both the Humvee and the launcher. And indeed, there should have been two serial numbers because there's one for the Humvee and one, one for the launcher. And, and, and had a review been done by the serial number then of both the launcher and the Humvee, both units would have been identified for the GAO a lot earlier. Are those DOD serial numbers, or are they manufacturer's serial numbers? 
Mr. Chairman, I, I do not know the answer to that well, question. Well, just because the reason I ask that is if, if it's a continuous number problem, that could confuse somebody that's doing inventory. On the other hand, if it's some manufacturer's number, it might be readily apparent that it is there's something wrong here. This isn't the way the numbers we have on missiles or the numbers we have on Humvees, whatever the case may be. Now, to track all this, have the people in your uh, office uh, figured out a way to solve that problem so they know immediately that there's something that isn't right here? Mr. Chairman, this is a logistics issue, and I hesitate to um, get too far afield from the financial world, but it is my understanding uh, that in the DOD logistics community, we are working um, towards an environment where every piece of DOD property will have its own identification number, in most cases that already exist. Um, but but I, I hesitate to get too far into the logistics arena. Do uh, you're from Mr. Kamansky's office, as I remember. Maybe you could explain to us the problems we have between the acquisition of items and then their assignment to units and then how we account for them in terms of uh, uh, this is where I think a lot of the $25 billion was missing. They just hadn't matched acquisition contract with inventory records to know that, yes, I bought it, but where is it now? Uh, is your office doing anything to coordinate with the financial people so we can find these things? Sir, I represent acquisition. My specialty is procurement. Right. And I'm not an expert on logistics. However, my limited understanding of this is we are keeping track now of secondary items like spare parts. Uh, the problem that you addressed earlier of commanders and chiefs not knowing where things are, I believe that problem is largely solved. We've put a hardware and software um, at all of the uh, unified commands in Europe and the Pacific Central Command um, that tells the commander in chief where every shipment is, what's on the shipment, so he knows what's coming to him and what he has in the logistic systems. As far as these primary items, like uh, a Humvee uh, a vehicle, my understanding is the military departments track those themselves. Um, I think the ultimate answer on this is electronic tagging or electronic recording and computer reading of the location of everything. We're not there yet. I think that's the vision and the goal to get there, uh, to identify the movement of systems and where everything is. There has been progress toward that. But we're not there yet for everything. Um, and I can get you more specifics if you wish, but that is my understanding of where we are and where we're going uh, in the logistics area as far as keeping track of all of this. Well, that would still require a serial number, I assume. And that would be... And this would be a global positioning use, I'm... Uh, there, it would be gather. a DOD serial number, yeah. is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, in some cases, we are having contractors put barcodes on things like spare parts so that they can be read by a barcode reader. Sure. Uh, in many cases, we're doing that. But on primary items that in, are a, an assemblage of several systems, DOD would assign codes to those, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you weren't here probably two years or so when we got into this, maybe you were, that uh, the Columbus Processing Center, did you as director of procurement uh, and your staff take a look at that situation and see why they were just writing checks without, uh, or at least a misreading of the acquisition document? Again, some of this involves mistakes that were made in these very long lines of accounting that Ms. Hill described. You'll have a citation on a contract assigned by a fiscal person for certain monies on that contract that may be up to 55 characters long. Before the age of automation, or even in the age of some automation, 
you have people manually putting those numbers in. When there's a mistake made, you pay from the wrong account and it doesn't match up later. We have several initiatives underway to improve that system, to avoid these unmatched disbursements. One is to eliminate a lot of these lines of accounting and to the maximum extent, maximum extent practicable, keep them at the appropriation level. Um, there'll be a letter going out shortly from uh, the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Technology and the controller to limit those lines of accounting. We're also automating so that the input on the lo long line of accounting goes in once and from there on is handled by computers and shared data warehouses. Um, we have a standard procurement system underway that will do some of that. DFAS is working, Defense Finance and Accounting Service is working to use that data to prevent the mistakes made as each clerk types in these long lines, several of them on a contract. So there are things underway to improve this. We're not there yet everywhere. Um, what is the policy in terms of when one does an inventory? Is it annually? Is it quarterly? Is it monthly? What? I don't know the answer to that. It is not in my area. I can get you uh, that answer. I don't know. How about it, Mr. Toy? Do you know the answer to that? No, I do not, Mr. Chairman. Well, let's get it and put it in the record. Does GAO uh, know it or the Inspector General's Office in Defense know it? Yeah, join us. Typically, there are, are, are annual cycles for inventory at each of the individual locations and activities. And then for the individual property books, when the accountable officers transfer, there's a reconciliation at that point in time as a, as a general proposition. Yeah, Mr. Warren, it seems to me there's uh, a difference, I guess, in the property book versus the records on occasion. Is there a way to reconcile that that the uh, GAO sees? Uh, um, between the mass, the central systems, uh, yes, there is a reconciliation process, as I understand, at the property book level. If there are discrepancies, that is to be worked out at that individual unit level to the satisfaction of the, uh, of the uh, commanding officer at that particular location, <coughs> the accountable officer for that property book. Now, is that accountable officer the commander of the base, or is it a... It would be an individual that had been designated that responsibility from the, from the uh, commanding officer of the base. Have we figured out a way to take the data out of those property books and input them in your accounting system that Mr. Toy runs? Mr. Chairman, if I may, That's the long-term solution to this issue is indeed the integration of systems which will bring the integration of information. That is indeed the department's proposed solution. We propose to integrate the defense property accountability system with the department's financial systems. That effort is underway. It is going to be a long-term effort. The issue here is the sharing of information electronically as opposed to the sharing of information manually. When information is shared in a manual mode, <coughs> the opportunities for errors obviously increase significantly. And what we need to do is to stop sharing information manually, share it electronically. And that is the corrective action that the Department of Defense has planned. How long do you think that will take? What's your estimate on that implementation, make it operational? It's difficult to, to answer that, that question. The initial target was fiscal year 2000. So that means we'll have it by 2004, I take it. Mr. Chairman, I hope we have it by, by 2000, but I cannot sit here yeah. and absolute guarantee that. Yeah. That's why I said 2004. Seems to me you've got enough going on the year 2000 problem right now to give that your full attention, uh, as they are in IRS and every other agency, I hope. Yes. Well, what can you do to give us a little feeling of uh, 
happiness and reliance on the acquisition procurement empire, the financial empire, and the three or services, three services plus the Marines, uh, that uh, something will happen in this area. Do we have integrated teams between those two undersecretaries where you're working on the problem together? Uh, yes, we are working very closely together. And as uh, Ms. Spector mentioned, what we have planned is an automated system in the acquisition world, in an automated system in the financial management world that will share the same database, they will share the same information, and they will share it in, a, in an electronic mode. And that will eliminate many of the problems that we have today, uh, again, which goes back to the manual entering and re-entering of information. And because some of these so-called long lines of counting contain multiple um, characters, it only takes one character to be off to result in a problem disbursement. And, and let me mention, if I, if I may, Mr. Chairman, that the Department of Defense now has a policy in, in place called pre-validation, where before we make a payment, in many instances, and the threshold will, will vary depending up, upon the, the system involved and where the payment uh, is involved, but in some cases, it is all the way down to zero. The, if the paying station is different from the accounting station, which is often the case in DOD, the paying station needs to pre-validate with the accounting station that an obligation has been made, that funds are available to make the payment. And they will do that and then transmit, they will then pay the bill and transmit the information to the accounting station. It is quite possible in that transmission stage that an error will be made, a digit will be transposed. And so even though we know that the payment is accurate because we ensure that, that it is a legitimate bill before we pay it, even though we have pre-validated the payment with the accounting station, and in transmitting the information to the accounting station, an error can occur that results in a problem disbursement, which then needs to be researched, and the error needs to be corrected, and then it and then it can and will be posted. Well, my time is up. I'll yield 20 minutes to the gentleman from Ohio. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to uh, ask Mr. Toy to comment on the, is that how you pronounce your name? Toy? Yes. Toy. To comment on uh, the testimony by the Inspector General for the Department of Defense where she says that, quote, my office has issued 181 audit reports on finance and accounting matters since I testified before you, and only a handful have been good news. It goes on to say that I cannot report to you that the department has successfully corrected the many shortcomings in its accounting and financial systems. Under the CFO Act, CFO. The, under the Chief Financial Officer Act, the, the department is required to prepare financial statements, which the audit, the Inspector General is required to, to audit. Within DOD, we prepare a number of financial statements for different entities. The problems that we have in, in DOD in terms of the deficiencies in our systems are unfortunately applicable to many reporting entities. So audit, we may have in a particular year uh, 19 different audit reports with the same finding because that is a DOD-wide um, deficiency that appears in each one of the reporting entities. And each entity is required to have an audit report, an audit which results in, in an audit report. So the numbers are, are somewhat misleading. But, but let me also say... Which numbers are misleading? The, the, the number of audit reports do not by themselves indicate the number of deficiencies because the same deficiency may be, and in many instances, is contained in different audit reports. So how many deficiencies are there then? 
I, I don't know that I can answer that question. I would say there are probably a handful of what I would call major deficiencies in the Department of Defense in the financial management uh, arena. Can, can I answer that? Uh, of course. Mr. Congressman, in, in the last uh, Secretary of Defense annual assurance statement to the President and the Congress, uh, I think he listed 29 material control weaknesses in the, in the finance and accounting area. I would ask uh, Mr. Toy to comment on the uh, finding by the Inspector General for the Department of Defense, which speaks to um, the reason for the disclaimer of opinion on all DOD general fund statements for 1997, uh, saying that the accounting system supporting Department of Defense general funds cannot compile and report accurate and reliable information, uh, that the accounting systems supporting Department of Defense general funds continue to lack integrated double entry transaction driven general ledgers to compile and report reliable and audible information. What do you have to say about that? Our accounting systems often do not provide the type of audit trail that the auditors are looking for. Our accounting systems were designed in a different era. They were designed to do appropriation accounting, to keep track of the dollars appropriated by the Congress, to ensure that the dollars were spent in the manner intended by the Congress for the purpose and intent that the Congress intended that they be spent for, and that we conform to the limitations and restrictions imposed by the Congress. Today, these same systems are being asked to do commercial or business type accounting, and they were not designed to accomplish that. So we do indeed have deficiencies in our accounting systems compared to new standards that those systems were not designed um, to, to, to meet. What we are doing to correct that situation is we have identified those systems that we think do a better job, and we are collapsing. As you heard earlier, we had 324 systems in 1991. We've collapsed that to 156 systems. We hope to go down to about 100, excuse me, to 32 systems. And we are not only eliminating the systems that don't do as good a job. In the remaining systems, we are upgrading those systems. We are enhancing them to meet the new accounting standards that are being imposed that were not in effect at the time these accounting systems were developed. So uh, continuing on with the observations of the Inspector General for the Department of Defense, they talk, uh, she talks of information not auditable because, and this is a quote, the accounting systems cannot produce an audit trail of information from occurrence of a transaction through its recognition in accounting records and ultimately to the general fund financial statements. Uh, are you saying then, Mr. Toy, that y y that's true by definition because you just don't have that kind of accounting system? I'm, I'm definitely not saying that our accounting systems can meet current audit standards. They cannot. An excellent example where information is not in our f financial systems, where there is not a sufficient audit trail, is, is property. Property records are maintained in logistics systems, not financial management systems. Now, to satisfy the, the audit trail requirements, DOD needs to provide receipts to verify the cost or the values that is in its property systems. In many cases, we're talking about property that's 20, 30, 50 or more years old. The record retention standard is six years and three months after DOD makes the last payment. We do not have documentation in many cases to meet the audit standards. That doesn't mean we don't have control of the assets. It doesn't mean that we don't know where the assets are. But from a financial management perspective, too often that information is not in our systems, and we do not have a sufficient audit trail back to the actual documentation 
to meet current audit standards. Are you just being held to too high a standard, uh, and that's why you would get this report from the General Accounting Office, which suggests that uh, the audit uh, condition of the Department of Defense is less than praiseworthy? The Department of Defense is not being held to a higher standard than any other agency in the federal government. I don't mean to imply that we are. What, what is true, though, is that we're being held to a standard today that we were not being held to in many instances when our current systems were developed. We need to do something about that. We are doing something about that. We are upgrading our accounting systems to meet current standards. But it is going to take us some time to complete that effort. Is it, unre is it unreasonable to ask for pieces of paper to be available to match uh, physical equipment? If we're talking about a recent purchase, the Department of Defense should have, and I believe does have, adequate documentation to support that purchase. But if we're talking about a purchase that happened 20, 30, or 40 years ago, and, and many of the items in DOD's property records are that old, we simply do not have that documentation because in many instances we have sent that documentation many years ago off to a records retention area and after a certain period of time those records have been destroyed. So is the General Accounting Office then uh, a financial audit of the Department of Defense uh, basically challenging you to do things that are impossible? What we need to do and what we have been doing is we've been working with the DODIG, with the General Accounting Office, with the Office of Management and Budget for the, the instances that I have mentioned to find if there is another test, reasonableness test, that can be applied that can satisfy the audit standards. We are still conducting those discuss discussions, we're still exploring ways that the auditors can verify the accuracy of our information if we cannot produce a receipt or a cost voucher for some of this older equipment or older property. And, and I'm hopeful that, that that process eventually will lead to a compromise where we can satisfy the auditors and, and they can be comfortable with, with the value that the Department of Defense has in its financial statements. The, what, the, uh, if, if I may, um, the testimony by the GAO, um, and I quote, speaks of serious material weaknesses were found in Department of Defense systems and processes relied on to maintain accountability and to control physical assets under its purview, <coughs> excuse me, including military equipment, uh, general property plant and equipment, and inventories. It goes on to say that overall these problems impair DOD's ability to know the location and the condition of all of its assets, including those used for deployment and safeguard assets from physical deterioration, theft or loss, and prevent the purchase of assets already on hand. That's a direct quote from the General Accounting Office. And you're telling this committee that you do have control, you know where everything is, you just don't have the papers to prove it, or you, you have an accounting system that you can't keep up with. I would say that is generally true. I certainly do not want to ply that there is no instance within DOD where an item uh, may not be today with a property record, say, uh, that, it, that it should be or, or it is. The Department of Defense is a very large organization. It has hundreds of thousands of items. On, on any given day, it's quite possible that an item may not be. It's not only quite possible, it is very likely that some items will not be physically where the property records state that, that, that they should be. But what one needs to do in that instance is to inquire as to where the item is. That does not necessarily mean that the department doesn't have control over that physical asset. For example, a Humvee 
uh, may be on the property records in property lot A. One may go out there and look and not find that Humvee. Humvee. It may well be that that Humvee is in the repair shop overgoing an overhaul. It may be uh, for whatever reason it had to be pressed in service because another vehicle was, was not available. So there certainly will be operational reasons in addition to the, to the fact that in some instances the paperwork just may not have cut, caught up with the physical transfer of an item. There are lots of reasons why the property records may not be 100 percent accurate. But I need, I need to repeat, um, if I may, what, what they What they say, if I, if I may, mm -hmm. is that uh, they speak of, this GAO report speaks of material deficiencies include Department of Defense's inability, and this is the top item, properly account for and report billions of dollars of property, equipment, inventory, and supplies. I, 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 Mr. Toy, I, you know, I take it that you're a fine public servant, and I appreciate you being here. Um, what I'm trying to determine here is if there's just a, a lack of communication between um, your division and the GAO, or if, in fact, we have things that are missing or that we can't find or that the department isn't sure of where they I mean, a actually, if we have testimony by the GAO, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned the helicopters where um, I think it mentioned 10 helicopters were, uh, in effect, uh, I, I think I remember the sense of it, that we had a duplicate purchase or something. Was that it, Mr. Chairman? Uh, do you remember? Not really. It's just uh, missing it should, from It should seem to me reasons. that there was a duplicate purchase. Now, if there's, if duplicate purchases occur, that means that we didn't know that we had it and we bought it a second time. I, I just wonder, you know, what the problem is here, you know, the nature of it, because it, we are talking about... Uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, taxpayers' money, and you know, if I take you at your word, uh, the, um, um, well, let me ask Mr. Lieberman, is this, is, is, or Mr. Warren to comment, is this really just a question of missing paperwork? Is that what's going on? We just have, do we just have a problem of missing paperwork here? Is that what this is all about? Well, we have several things intertwined in each other here. Uh, let me see if I can work through a couple of them. In, in some cases, yes, the, the property is properly controlled by in a property book or in a logistics system. It's not lost, but that system is unable to tell the financial system that that item exists. Uh, from an audit standpoint, we can't go looking for millions of items in the Defense Department down to the unit level every year, nor can senior managers rely on information that's incomplete. Um, I, I think a telling example uh, is in the warehouses. We went out and did an inventory in 16 different DOD warehouse facilities. And now I'm not talking about end items like planes and trucks. I'm talking about truck batteries and flashlight batteries and screws and bolts and things like that. We found a 16 percent error rate in the inventory records of the warehouses, which was much higher than we expected. Now, in terms of dollars... In, in, is this missing paperwork? I mean, are, are you filing actual kind of No, this is... Errors? We go out, we look at the inventory record. The, the warehouse thinks it has a hundred truck batteries on the shelf, we go and count how many batteries are on the shelf, and it's not 100. So the inventory record locally is wrong. Now, in, in many cases, there are more batteries on the shelf than the inventory record indicates. Well, is, uh, is that like what Mr. Toy said? Look, it's there. It, well, Is it there? It's or is there. It? Unfortunately, the item manager doesn't know it's there. When you have overages, uh, first of all, you're you remember that song. I hear music, and there's and there's no one there. I wonder why. Uh, That's right. It's, yep. it's there, but we don't if, know it's there. If you have more items there than are on the inventory record, that means they're not really controlled. That means that somebody could walk out the door with them tomorrow, and no one would ever know they were gone because ah, okay. they didn't know they were there in the first place. 
conversely, when you have shortages and you don't know it, all of a sudden you'll be unable to fill a requisition one day and you'll wonder why. Um, so this is real, this is down where the department really operates on a day-to-day -day basis, filling supply requisitions and things like that. So it, it's not quite the arcane accounting drill back up here in Washington that we're talking about. So th this does have practical world consequences. Well, I've tried to, uh, in my questioning, or avoid a uh, he said, she said kind of thing because, I mean, frankly, we have two different views on, on accounting here. and. Uh, but I want to make sure that there's one view on accountability. Mm -hmm. There's accounting and then there's accountability. Accountability meaning accountability to the taxpayers of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So it, it appears that your statements in some ways can be reconciled, but at the same time I want to make sure there is a recognition that there are some physical problems in the system and that it's not simply a matter of a paper chase. I, am I, do I capture that correctly, Mr. Lieberman? Yes, I think my good friend Nelson and I are closer on this than it may appear. Uh, Can I just, uh, Mr. just add on that? I, I think we've hit on an important point. We really have two problems here. We have poor financial management data, but what we're also finding when we go to the feeder systems that provide information for those financial reports, we're also finding that we have poor day-to-day -day management information systems that support our logistics managers. That, that, that is the situation. We've uncovered two deficiencies, really, as a result of, of this audit, and, and this is work that we've done in the past. And I, th I think in summary, that's what... So this that, isn't that, just a matter of things that are from 40 years ago. You're saying there's some ongoing problems. Particularly not with regard to inventory. I mean, uh, that, and that is why, and I think that's why the department would say they have an effort that... Uh, Nelson referred to, uh, uh, to be complete in the year 2000, they call it total asset visibility. The department would like to get total asset visibility uh, of all of the assets that they own, and they recognize they uh, desperately need to do that, and that's a management initiative in the logistics community so that they can operate in the same way that uh, UPS does, for okay. example. Well, I, you know, I, I appreciate your, uh, this dialogue here because it helps us to better understand where you're coming from. Uh, and again, this is, none of this is meant to uh, construe on anyone's part here a lack of diligence. Uh, we recognize, as the testimony of the Inspector General for the Department of Defense did, that there are some historic inadequacies in financial management. We also have a, an obligation to try to see, can we move from that paradigm to one in which we could have more assurance uh, that the resources are being managed in a way uh, that's uh, responsible and that we can verify and account for them. Sir, could I make one other quick point of clarification? Sure. Sure. Uh, I'm uh, going to pursue I, some of this anyhow. Go ahead. I can't really sit here and let, let the idea pass by that we're looking for 50-year-old bills uh, receipts. Um, we know that such things don't exist. And the problem is to come up with some way of reliably estimating what these facilities are worth at, at the present time. And we are working very hard, as, as Nelson indicated, with GAO, with OMB, with the department, in trying to figure out models to use. There have been two attempts, frankly, both have busted because we, we tested the the cost coming out of the model for a 50-year-old, I'll use warehouse again, uh, against those facilities where we actually did have data and we know what they cost and stuff like that. And, and we had such wide variances that both models obviously didn't work. But, but we're going to keep trying because that's the only way out of this, uh, other, than, other than just write it off somehow as immaterial and get it out of the statements, which I don't think is a viable option. Let, Thank you. Thank me, you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me pursue some of this uh, because I'm just curious what we're seeking in the financial accounting system. Are we seeking a separate system that simply lists inventory? Maybe you look at it as you would a capital budget in a corporation. 
where uh, certain things that are above $2 million or something are considered one way, and all the little pieces and screwdrivers and all the rest of it are just a lump sum the other way. And uh, what are we trying? Are we trying to just say it's here, or are we saying, well, what's the replacement cost on this? And keeping updated on replacement in terms of the value that would be assigned to that particular item. What's the, who's got the answer to this as the best way to go about that? M Mr. Chairman, from a financial statement perspective, the end result is to accurately reflect the dollar value in the financial statement. Okay, and which dollar value are you taking? Replacement cost, amortized cost? If we're talking property, the, the current standard asks us to use the historical cost. The, the instances that we've been talking about where we're struggling is where we don't have the records to demonstrate the historical cost. We may even have an entry into our records that tell us what the historical cost uh, were at the time of purchase, but we are unable to support that with documentation to demonstrate that that number is in, indeed accurate. But, but the standard is historical cost, not replacement cost for property. There are some exceptions. Uh, inventory, uh, you have a choice. You can use historical costs or you can use current acquisition costs. But by and large, the property standard is the historical cost. How is current acquisition cost any different from replacement cost? Some people might say that, that, that it, is, it is the same. The pr primary or technical difference might be that the latest acquisition cost is the last purchase. The replacement cost might be viewed as the next purchase price. Yeah, it seems to me you have to sort out this into a number of different categories just to make logical sense. If you're budgeting, that means we need to look at the replacement cost. If you're simply saying this is the total value because we're running an accounting mm -hmm. system, not an inventory system of 8,000 widgets here, we're, got it, we're putting a value on them. And the value, as you say, could be the historic cost. Frankly, it would mean nothing, in my humble opinion. I wouldn't even look at a accounting sheet that way, unless you'd had it, if it's land, let's say, I'd want an auction to see what that land is worth. Because no appraiser would be able to go on a military base like Fort Ord and say, well, you know, Seaside and Monterey, we sell land for this, maybe, but that isn't what happened at Fort Ord. It's a university, it's a number of other nonprofits and so forth that are there. So how do you really pick that cost? I'll leave it to the accountants to worry about, but it seems to me there's got to be some sensible system for the managers that are trying to manage the Department of Defense. And you want to know there what are my obligations down the line? How much is this going to cost me if somebody's drunk at night and runs this contraption over a cliff? And we need to know what's the experience? How many incidents like that have we had? How many replacement things did we do last year? That makes some sense to me in an accounting budgeting system. And I would think also I'd like to know just on your computing side, on the, to what degree between now and year 2000, on both the 2000 problem and getting you to get a financial statement that makes sense, do we need replacement of hardware? Or is it simply software? Could you enlighten me on that? Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I, I do need to say I couldn't agree with you more with regard to the accounting data as opposed to the budget data. The information in some cases is not the same. It should not be the same, and they're used for different purposes. With regard to the uh, computer issues, let's take the year 2000 issue first, if, if I may. Uh, in the financial world, the department has identified um, those financial systems that are not year 2000 compliant and those that um, are compliant, the department has a plan for making compliant those systems that are not compliant. It has a schedule to 
make those systems compliant. And I fully expect that the department and the, and the financial community will indeed make those systems compliant long before, I shouldn't say long, but certainly before the year 2000. With regard to your second uh, question, as relates to audited financial statements, the department does not project at the current time that it will be able to modify all of its financial management systems by the year 2000. It will be beyond that before the department can bring its accounting and finance systems into compliance with the current accounting requirements. Now, is that uh, effort uh, headed basically by your shop, the undersecretary for controllership? The chief financial officer, the undersecretary for of defense control of Bill Lynn mm -hmm. is indeed responsible for ensuring that the financial management systems are brought into compliance. The Defense Finance and Accounting Service is the operating arm of the controller organization that is actually doing, doing the work. Is there a plan where people are meeting weekly and making sure things are being done to conform to getting this thing implemented by the year 2000? Uh, y yes, there is. There, the department has had a plan for a number of years and at the direction of the Congress is currently doing another plan, a concept of operations, which will address system issues in more detail. Let me ask you, is there any difference in the accounting systems used for the active forces versus the reserve forces, both in terms of uh, the methodology, but also in the computers they have or don't have? In other words, have the reserve forces been sort of given the leftovers of one generation and trying to keep track of their financial and inventory matters, the contractual matters, in any different way than the active forces? I, I certainly wouldn't characterize the systems of the reserve components as leftover systems. No, I'm just uh, saying, are there? The, as I indicated earlier, in 1991, we had 324 systems, each one of them different. We're now down to 156 finance and accounting systems, each one different. Uh, we are headed towards 32 systems is, is our ob objective. So the answer has to be yes, the systems we have today are different. They operate on different hardware. They use different software. software. The idea is will we perform similar functions to try to consolidate similar functions onto similar systems. We certainly are not there at this point in time. Is there any comment any of the other of you want to make on what you've heard from the Department of Defense? Any further comments from anybody? This is your last chance. Yes, Ms. Jacobson. I, I would just emphasize that this is the logistics issue is, is not um, is a, tr a real issue of not having adequate visibility over the assets from a logistical standpoint and a financial accounting standpoint. It is not a question of uh, paperwork. Pati the examples that we gave on CBSX, the Army's visibility system, their goal is to have 98 percent visibility of that equipment at all times. The work we did showed at a, at a maximum they had 87 percent visibility over their assets. That's a 13% um, invisibility, um, and, and that means an efficiency as well. So I, I would just say it, it is not a question, uh, and emphasize that it is not a question of, uh, of uh, paperwork, but is truly a question of whether they know where their assets are and, and how many they have of these items. Well, I guess I would need to know from uh, Mr. Lynn and Mr. Kamansky's shop are you working together to get a common definition here? Uh, I mean, has, or has that already been decided and defined and set up so people have a goal, they know what to achieve? The department has a number of addition, uh, initiatives excuse me, un underway. The department fully recognizes that we cannot achieve auditable financial statements 
without closer working relationships between the financial management community and many other communities within, within DOD. One of the efforts that is ongoing within the department is the standardization of data to ensure that when we say A, we all understand what A right. is and, and all uh, speak the, the, the same language and, and have the same interpretation of, of uh, similar words. So those efforts are underway within DOD. Yes, sir. Good. Anything you want to say about what anything else on the GAO, the IGs group, any comments you have? Either uh, Ms. Spector, I just want to make sure every the dialogue's out on the table. Okay. I, I would just like to say, Mr. Chairman, again, just to reiter reiterate that I am an accountant. Financial management is important to me. I will indicate to you that I met with the Secretary of Defense earlier this week. The Secretary is interested in financial management. The department takes this seriously. It has plans underway. It is not moving as quickly as others may um, want us to move. We're moving at a deliberate pace. It's a big organization. We take it seriously. We'll get the job done. It just will take some time. Well, I appreciate that. And let me just say I want to thank each of you for coming. I want to make a few announcements in closing. Uh, tomorrow we will continue our series of hearings on financial management in the federal government's executive branch and at bat will be the Social Security Administration and we will be discussing how they've achieved their effective financial management in a lessons learned type thing. They've been sort of at the A level of all the things we've been grading on including strategic plans, financial management plans, so forth. Uh, next Tuesday, April 21st, is about the time of the 20th anniversary of the Inspector Generals. And we'll be having a hearing with them, and they'll be presenting testimony on oversight uh, as to whether the act under which they uh, have existed now for two decades should be revised in any way. And finally, next week on uh, uh, the uh, f Friday, April 24th, We'll be joining a joint hearing of the two subcommittees, Health and Oversight of Commerce, with ourselves, looking at the Health Care Financing Administration's finances. We're going to see what HICFA is doing, uh, and uh, given the consolidated uh, audit and balance uh, sheet that they put out recently, uh, the conclusions were drawn that there were about $23 billion in erroneous Medicare payments. So we'll obviously be pursuing that. And I want to thank the staff that helped put together this hearing. Uh, J. Russell George, who's seated behind me, Staff Director, General Counsel. Seated to my left, your right, Diane Ginsburg, detailee from uh, the General Accounting Office. And uh, Pentagon, we'd welcome your detailees, too, over here. We're not biased, but uh, any experts were willing to tap their brains long as you pay them. Uh, John Hines, professional staff member. Uh, Matthew Ebert, clerk, professional staff member, staff assistant. Uh, Mason Allinger. Uh, David Coer, this is his last hearing with us. He's going to go back to full-time study at USC. That's not the University of South Carolina Easterners. That's the University of Southern California. And uh, Cami White, intern. And then on the Democratic side, we have Mark Stevenson, uh, Gene Gosa is their clerk, and then our faithful court reporters who are tired of listening to all this, I'm sure, uh, Ryan Jackson and Doreen Daedler. Uh, is that how it's pronounced? Yes. We thank you all, and uh, this committee will be in recess until tomorrow morning.
for watching C-SPAN 2. Here's what's ahead. Next, IRS Commissioner Charles Rosati on the future of the agency. Then, three American Association of Retired...